I just turn off whenever I see the man versus woman match where the dude is beating the shit out of the woman. It never works. There's still the thing where it just isn't right when the dude is beating and beating and slapping and beating the shit out of the woman. Nobody beats the shit out of Ivelisse. I never get turned off by it. You know, sometimes they beat on her, sometimes she beat on them. She beats this guy, whatever. It doesn't matter. It's just a bunch of and f***ing and moves. But when they put Superfly in here and he's just like, he's f***ing her and he's f***ing her in the face and he's f***ing her. It's just like, this is now officially no fun to me. No way your joke is worse than that. It's impossible. <laughs> oh, God. What's happened? <laughs> <laughs> Who sent that in? Ah. <laughs> uh. He deserves a gold James. star. Nice job, James. Thank you. You know what's amazing? <clears throat> We're all sober. <laughs> Kinda. Well, you should start drinking. We probably so. mellow out. We should. Oh, God. <laughs> should we talk about Nitro? Sure, why not? A million degrees in here right now. <laughs> That's your fault. You guys started this. <laughs> Monday Nitro, June 3rd, 1996. Oh, I got an even better one later. Maybe not better. It's got potential, though. Gene Oakland brought out Shark for a promo ah! on the ramp. <laughs> it's off the rails immediately. <laughs> I just think, like, think you make that noise whenever <laughs> I say the word shark. Nitro opened with Mean Gene interviewing the shark. Yes. And Mean Gene, he takes the mic <laughs> and he says, and I quote, This is the shark. <laughs> so Shark comes out. And he is looking intently to the left side of the arena, staring straight ahead, or staring to that side. He has plain blue and black gear on, no face paint. And Oakland says, Shark, your haircut, that made me physically ill. And so he said he was, he was rendered physically ill by watching the shark get a haircut. Mm -hmm. So Shark turned his head and he revealed that, yes, John Tenta shaved off half of his hair. Who? Or uh, 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 Big Bubba shaved off half of John Tenta's hair. But who's John Tenta? Oh, well, it turns out that's the shark. Explain what he said. Well, this is a very famous promo. I'll read it. I'll verbatim. <laughs> I, I, well, I know the quote, yes. Where's my music? <laughs> Actually might help with this here. I'm not the shark. I'm not a fish. I'm not an avalanche. I'm a man. John Tenta. A 500-pound man. I'm going to hurt the man who did this to me. Then I'm going to shave the head of the giant, and he'll feel the embarrassment I felt. His name should have been John Tuna. Basically, he was not a fish. Yeah. Yeah, this is the notorious I am not a fish promo. I know he was right. He's not a fish. He is not a fish. He is a 500-pound man. And, and here's the thing. He had a skullet. Yeah. They, 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 yes. Okay. And so, Bubba came out and shaved half of it. Mm -hmm. And he kept the other half because it wanted. he wanted to remind himself. Of the pain. Of the humiliation. Of a full week of walking around in public, getting on airplanes and going to towns. Going to get his mail, he said. He walked around like that. He said he went to get his mail and his neighbors laughed at him. He said it helped him relive the embarrassment. Yeah. I need to call Whitney's sister, who's a psychiatrist, and ask her about this idea. Because I don't think this is the best thing for John Tenta. Probably not healthy. So, this is part of the key to this, of how stupid all this was. They did the half-shaven hair gimmick on a guy who was already half-bald. Right. He invented it under a quarter head of hair. It would have been like uh, giving Paul Heyman a haircut. Yes. People... 
honestly, when he turned and looked at the camera, I was like, which side got cut? I'm not sure. So it led to John Tenta versus Big Bubba. Was he the avalanche? Yeah. Was he? He's the avalanche in the Dungeon of Doom. That's right. And that's was, right. Or, excuse me. No. It was pre-Dungeon of Doom, the, whatever they called their group. It was the Butcher, Kevin Sullivan, and the Avalanche. I forget what they, forget, I forget what they called themselves. Um, Tenda versus Bubba. Classic WCW. Tony Schiavone says, folks, we ran an ad in USA Today promoting appearances by Vader and Johnny B. Bad. They don't wrestle here, here anymore. An amazing company this was. So, Tenta chases Bubba out of the ring with a pair of scissors. Let me talk about this. First off, it's our boy Nick Patrick is the ref, so I shouldn't be surprised by any of this. Mm -hmm. John Tenta gets in the ring, and he whips out a pair of sharp scissors. Bladed right. object. He tries to kill. He tries to kill. Let me repeat that one more time. He tries to kill Big Bubba with scissors. Yes. Mm -hmm. Nick Patrick does not signal for the bell, but when Bubba leaves the ring, he counts him out. Yes. Because Bubba would not get in the ring with a man, an angry man, an angry 500-pound man who's not a fish, mm -hmm. but who has scissors. He counts him out. Yeah, that was stupid. How did that not win worst promotional tactic for 1996? <laughs> What well, could have possibly been worse? I'm going to look it up. <laughs> Maybe even worse was promoting appearances by Johnny B. Bad and Vader when they left months ago. High Voltage versus Faces of Fear. Oh, these two. I bet you anything without looking that it was actually the fake Razor and Diesel. Oh, you're probably right. So Larry Zabisco had a line about how he didn't like High Voltage because the last thing they needed around there was more Watts. High Voltage? Yes, they were in this match. I thought it was Blake and Murphy. I made the same thing. <laughs> High Voltage is a supersized version of Blake and Murphy. <laughs> yeah. They are competent. They are completely generic. They're just out there doing stuff. When they walked out, it was like, those guys stranded at the power plant. I was right. Fake Diesel, Razor Ramon, and the real Double J. Man. What was the real Double J? Road Dog, probably. Because Road Dog was singing and it turned out, Okay. And really, Jesse that James. was worst. All right. <laughs> hey, seems like it's a generic, stupid mid '90s thing. Times have changed. Yeah. Anyway, Faces of Fear here looked awesome. <laughs> 2014 was WWE insulting fans who purchased pay per views. Hmm. <laughs> That's it. Wow. <laughs> Nothing happened in TNA all year. <laughs> I'm sure if we went back, we could find something. So uh, they were tossing high voltage around here, busting all kinds of agility moves. Had a top rope belly to belly, stereo diving headbutts, and then high voltage A tried to break up the pin. They threw him out of the ring. I love this so much. They hit their big combo double team finish. But the other guy broke up the pin, so they threw him out of the ring and then very casually hit the first guy with a super kick and won. I thought this was great. I thought this was awesome. Dest this is a five star squash match. Destructive squashes always get over. Yeah. And this was a great one. Tony Schiavone at one point said, and I quote, WCW, where the big boys bump and run into each other all the time. <laughs> yeah. That's what he said. I like when Larry said that Meng and Haku, or uh, Haku and Barbarian, were one generation from cannibals. What? That's what he said. They, they said the same stuff he, about... Uh, he didn't quite say cannibals. He said they're one generation removed from not being vegetarians, if you know what I mean. Yeah. Mm. Heyman said the same thing about Roman's family. That would be their fathers. Yeah. That's just not right. It's very rude. That's just not right. No. Oakland interviewed Lex Luger and Sting backstage. I'm very tolerant of cannibals. <laughs> you hear the joke about the two cannibals? No, Craig. Tell us about the two cannibals. These two cannibals are eating a clown, and one looks at the other and says, Hey, this tastes funny to you. Stand by, everybody. <laughs> Wait for it. That was a long explosion. <laughs> Ten full uh, seconds. Oh, God. I got another one. Please, no. How about candles? No. Oh, just go on. Oakland interview Lex Luger and Sting backstage. Luger said last week he had come down to the ring to cheer on Sting, his tag team partner. 
And suddenly the Steiners had double teamed him. Sting said, Lex, let's be honest. Scott was about to suplex me. And you kicked him in the gut. And Lex said, I have known the Steiners forever. We're all very competitive. I don't know why Scott would do something so vicious as to try a suplex on the floor if they really are friends. And the Steiners came in to argue and Sting said, hey, you know what? Lex has got a point. If he was getting a suplex on the floor, I'd probably break it up too. And then Scott started to talk. And this is going to sound stupid, but I'm going to say it anyway. It was Scott Steiner cutting this promo but all I could hear is Big Papa Pump's voice. <laughs> that yeah. sounded pretty stupid. It sounds stupid. Yeah. So there was a uh, brief starting match, and the team <laughs> went the separate dumbest ways. thing you've ever said on this show. <laughs> Scott Steiner did a promo. All I could hear was Scott Steiner. <laughs> See, there was a... He didn't sound like this early in his career. Maybe because he just never cut promos in general. He was never angry. That may have been it. He was always a smiling baby face. You was, know, if it weren't for his mullet, he'd look just like Big Papa Pump. Might have. Right. Might have. Sunglasses, bleach blonde. And he quit shot of Hulk Hogan beating people up. As hey, you're missing commercial. the very end when, when they got a shoving match and Gene flipped his lid and yes. said, if this ever happens again, I'm never interviewing you again. <laughs> I did miss that part. That was great. Disco Inferno versus Craig Pittman. Jesus. This sucked. <laughs> this was not very good. From the first move. They fucked up the first arm drag. An arm, arm drag. It was an arm bar. It was an arm drag. It was an arm drag. Yeah. And then, and then Pittman decided that he was going to be the first generation <laughs> Titus O'Neil. I was going to pick you up and throw your ass all over. Who knows where you'll land? Uh-huh. Protect yourself at all times. And then he goes for the code red and Disco quit. Yep. And nobody in the crowd had any fucking idea what was going on. And Disco Inferno laughs and he says, because I tapped out before the hold got put on, I've retained my ability to dance. That's right. Mm-hmm. Didn't care one bit about money. No. Losing his... Nope. His win bonus. No, no, no. This is fucking horrid in every way. <laughs> He's out there. See, I when I, I actually remember this live, and I thought this was hysterical live. Because he just wanted to dance and avoid pain. Well, you know, you could quit the moment the hole gets put on. It still wouldn't hurt. I also like there were guys... So little faith that he couldn't reverse this. Dancing to Disco's music, one of them wearing a gangsta's t-shirt. Yes, saw that as well. <laughs> And oh, then, that sucked. And then I, things got awesome. I did write, this made me laugh, but I might have been the only one. Wait a second. What got awesome, Craig? The, Regal and Hacksaw? Yeah. Well, the angle before that. I see. I'm assuming that's what, he's, uh, what Craig is talking about. I think he's talking about the match. Yeah, I love the match. Well, <laughs> okay. Before the match, don't get ahead of me here. Go ahead. He had an angle with Steven Regal and Sting from Saturday night. Yes. I believe it was a contract signing or something. But the point is, Regal started to leave, Sting grabbed his shoulder, and then Regal delivered a backhand slap of complete death. Oh, yeah. <laughs> he railed this man in the face. Yep. Get that drop. So, Stephen Regal versus Hacksaw Jim Duggan. Craig, tell us what you loved about this match. Jim Duggan is out there being an animated cartoon character. Yes. From the U.S. of A. Only to be outshone by the cartoon character that was William Regal. That's that's true. Okay. The best I can give you is that this was the best Duggan match in a long time. Right. That's saying nothing. This was the best match since probably his match with Shawn Michaels on Raw, which actually was a really good match. Mm -hmm. Geeks interfered. Hacksaw finally (laughs) successfully taped his fucking fist. But then he punched the wrong guy and was rolled up and pinned. Then the heels tried to steal his board. And God forbid, two by fours are hard to come by. And so Hacksaw had to give chase. I believe he got it back. Yes. Otherwise, he's going to be showing up next week with no two by four. And then he's going to be in real trouble. No tape and no two by four. You got nothing left. Okay, here's, here's, the, here's where, you, where, where you went wrong, Brian. You focused on anything other than William Regal being funny. Right. <laughs> Regal's always funny. He was at another level here. Mm-hmm. He, he, he looked across the ring and said, this man over there is a terrible pro wrestler. I will not have a good grappling battle with him. I can only have a good cartoon with him. Right. And he had a great cartoon. Eh. Oh, so now you thought it was a great match. I didn't say that. I said it was a great cartoon. I see. Afterwards, he did cut cut an awesome promo afterwards. He's got his whole crew there, the Blue Bloods. He said, WCW had the audacity to fine him for slapping Sting, fine him more than most fans could pay in a year, but it was a pittance for him, so he gladly paid double. Could have called out Sting in the ring like anyone else, but he wanted to Sting at his best. He wanted him angry and nasty, and he vowed to beat Sting in the Great American Bash. Tremendous promo. 
I liked it. He admitted he was rich. Stinking rich. So rich he paid double the fine, so he's got diabolical credit. That's How's right. how nobody else ever come up with that before? I don't know. That's a great line. Are you going to find me? I'll pay double, and now I owe you trouble. Hmm. Had a series of promos from Saturday night with trouble, trouble brewing between Chris Benoit and Kevin Sullivan. I got to say, thank God they're finally showing angles from the weekend shows. That's true. That is one benefit to moving to two hours. The only benefit I've seen thus far, because they never did this when they only had an hour. But now that they've got two hours, we're actually seeing recaps, and I know what the fuck's going on. Yeah, yeah. Before, they would just have things happen and explain that something happened on another show, and I was like, what? So uh, they were teammates, an amazing coincidence, in Battle Bowl, they were teammates by random chance, and the other team, also by random chance, was both dudes in Public Enemy. Hmm. Amazing. And then Sullivan actually held Benoit on a table so Public Enemy could put him through it. Holy smokes, if you go to... The Sharks Wikipedia, and by that I mean John Tenta, there's actually a photo of him from his sumo days when he had slightly more hair. He was still very large. Kevin, Kevin Sullivan then came out and beat the holy crap out of Prince Ikea. Squaw- right, before we talk about this, Vinny, mm-hmm. one trivia question. All right. Without looking at his Wikipedia... Mm-hmm. I want you to tell me what you think John Tenta's nickname was during his sumo career. I'll give you a hint, because otherwise it would be impossible. It's two words. All right. The first word is Canadian, Uh. and the second word also starts with a C. Crusher? Would you like to guess, Craig? I've just drawn a complete blank. His nickname was the Canadian Comet. Comet? <laughs> That's what they called him. Huh. He Does... was also nicknamed Koto Tenzan, which is Japanese for Heavenly Mountain Harp. A comet because he could be circling the Earth? Maybe. Hmm. I think the Earth would circle him. Sumo wrestler. Anyway. So Sullivan pinned IK with a foot stomp in a minute. And Oakland interviewed Kevin Sullivan and Jimmy Hart. Hart wanted to know why Sullivan was wasting the Dungeon of Doom's time by starting trouble with the Four Horsemen. Sullivan said, There are two wars going on in WCW. One fought by the legal department. Well, that was true. A, well, it was. <laughs> <laughs> that week, actually. Yeah. And one waged on Hulkamania. He said Hulkamania was not dead. And it was coming back to get all of them. Yeah. So the only people he respected in this business were Ric Flair and Art Anderson. He tried to warn them about Brian Pillman, and he turned out to be a quitter. He knew Benoit was no quitter, but he was going to get rid of Benoit so he and the horseman could get rid of Hogan. Huh. What? I don't know. This made no sense. Rock and Roll Express versus Ric Flair and Art Anderson. Flair and Anderson came out wearing Kevin Green's and Steve McMichael's football jerseys. And Orange was so tight, the women had to help him get it off. <laughs> the best part of this match was they all get in the ring. They're all getting ready to wrestle. The bell rings. And they begin to prepare to lock up. Mm-hmm. And the moment this happens, hour two begins. <laughs> yes. And so they set off fireworks. Lots of them. So Orange's response is to jump about 10 feet in the air. Because I guess he thought somebody was shooting at him. He's scared shitless. Flair's response is to leap out of the ring and run over to his table and start drinking. Yes. I guess because he thought it was New Year's Eve. (laughs) It's the end of the world. Yeah. And then they had an awesome double figure four spot with the baby faces. This is a great tag match. Arn broke up with an eye rake. And then Flair did his shoving gimmick with Pee Wee Anderson that he does every week, but still works every single solitary they week. He took the shoving match to the floor. Yes. <laughs> this time. It was so great. It was tremendous. Ric Flair versus Ricky Morton in 1996 was just as great as it was in 1986. I wish I could have had a match with the Rock and Roll Express. Matt, my... Probably still time, I gotta think about it. One of my most vivid memories is when the horseman broke Ricky Morton's nose. And he had to wear that uh, that gimmick, gimmick over his face. Oh, yes. Yeah. 
Such a great angle. While we're on the subject of great tag teams of days gone by. And days of yore. Days of yore. We should make note of the sad passing of Tommy Rogers. That's right. Everyone, I recommend you all go watch some Fantastic matches. Mm. And if you say, Vinny, what are some good Fantastic matches? I would respond, all of them. They were a great babyface tag team. They really were awesome. So this match ruled. And uh, the other great thing about this was the gimmick is Flair and Arn had asked Heenan to be their manager for this match against the football players. And Heenan was not going to give an answer until, well, the end of this match. But Heenan on commentary, usually he's out there just making jokes and this and that, and he's funny. But here he's pointing out everything Rick and, F- and Arn are doing right and, and uh, increasing their chances to win and everything they are doing wrong. I the Rock and Roll Express back in the match. And it made it a very sport-ish presentation, putting these sports in sports entertainment. And it was tremendous. And finally, he leaves the announce desk. He whispers something to Liz and Woman. And shortly thereafter, Woman rakes uh, Gibson's eyes and Arnett's DDT and they win. And it was all because of Heenan's advice. That was the key. So Oakland goes to interview the winning team. Arn notes the jersey was way too small for him. Clearly, he was too big and thick to play football. Flair said the jerseys were gifts from Deborah McMichael. And this proved she loved the Nature Boy. He called out everyone on the Carolina Panthers and everyone in the NFL. Said, we are too big and fast for any of you to handle. Heenan stepped in. He says, people have been begging me to manage them for years. I have turned them all down. Because I promised myself I would never manage again. Flair, Arn, I respect you both. You made me a very generous offer. But I cannot break that promise. I wish you luck, but I will never manage again. And he started to walk away. And Flair could not believe Heenan turned down his offer and screamed, What about the girls? <laughs> And he never returned. He pulled out a briefcase. He said in 1988, John Madden had named his all Madden team. And here, this award proved that Bobby Heenan was named manager of that all Madden team. Therefore, though he was not going to manage again, he would coach again. And he would coach the horsemen to win against those stupid football players. And Flair was happy and they all left together. Fabulous segment. You know what's amazing about it is, is it really was kind of an invasion angle. He had football players coming in to face wrestlers. And Bobby Heenan actually cut an amazing babyface promo. I've been in this business forever. I love this business. I love wrestling. And goddamn if these fucking football players are going to come in here and think they're just going to waltz on in and run the show. I will coach these wrestlers against these. And when you think about it, it's like, man, I'm going to get behind Flair and Arn and Heenan. But they're the heels. (laughs) Mongo. It's a baby face. It never was to me. Not to me. Yeah. I think everybody should have been cheering. In fact, I wonder if they did. I can't even remember. I think they did. I think I think the fans end up cheering Flair and Arn and booing Mongo and, and Kevin Green. I could be wrong. We'll know soon enough. Giant and Hogan cut 10 second promos about Nitro and WCW in general. Had a Blood Runs Cold promo. I think they've been running for a month now. I think this is the first time they actually said Glacier is coming. I oh, think, man. I think an actual Glacier would get here faster <laughs> than Glacier. It'd be a better worker than Glacier. Might have gotten over. Had another Hulk Hogan video package. <laughs> it was all him hitting dudes in the face, saying, huh, huh, <laughs> He did say a lot of that. <laughs> There's a montage of unprotected chair shots to the head. Awesome. Ice Train versus Giant. Anyone else know what this was? This was Daniel Bryan versus Sheamus, except Ice Train didn't kiss Jimmy Hart. That, well, yeah. But he was distracted and immediately choke slammed and pinned. Yeah, and Giant pinned him while flexing his biceps. Yeah. So Scott Norton comes to yell at Giant, said Ice Train wasn't ready. So Giant choke slammed him too, twice in fact. And Oakland interviews Giant. Giant is outraged that he is the world champion, but Hulk Hogan's getting all the video packages. Hey, he's got a point. He says, I've taken out Sting. I took out Randy Savage. Lex Luger, you're next. You tried to get between me and Jimmy Hart. Now you're coming to take my belt. I'm not going to let that happen. This is a great, great, great promo. I know we've said it many times, but in the, the top rookie years of pro wrestlers of all time, it's Angle and Giant neck and neck, and then a massive drop-off. Maybe Brock Lesnar, but... God, Giant was awesome. And then Scott Norton was scheduled to wrestle Hugh Morris. The doctors were still checking on Norton after his two choke slams. 
My boy Nick Patrick. <laughs> this fucking guy got choke slammed twice. He's on the ground, not moving. No, he is moving, Scott Norton. Mm -hmm. Bischoff says he might be having a mild seizure. Mm -hmm. yeah. So as he's writhing on the man, having a mild seizure, and as, as Heenan notes, he can barely move his arms and legs, Nick Patrick goes, ring the bell! He Let's was, have this fucking match now! He was a terrible rep. Get your ass up, dude! So Morris beats up Norton's limp body for a while, and the big payoff is supposed to be that Morris would try a moonsault, but Norton would get up and catch him. That was the idea. Instead, Norton dropped him, perhaps on his head, because he dropped him on this catch. He hit two punches as Morris lay there on the mat, and then he pinned him. <laughs> he pinned him by putting his hands on Hugh Morris's face mm -hmm. and <laughs> holding him on the mat. That was a real pin. This was a disaster. Yeah, I don't know what they were thinking. This was like 15 minutes of really bad television. I mean, I know Scott Norton is really strong. But really, you're gonna you're gonna catch Hugh Morris doing a moon flying through the air. Come, he's almost on. as big as you are. Yeah, the Steve and Michael Kevin Green training video. Oh come on, this was awesome. <laughs> the first thing they did was they got in the ring and realized, shit, this is hard. Yeah, the ropes hurt. The turnbuckles hurt. The mat hurts. They're yeah, running the ropes with footballs in their hands. <laughs> yeah, do that. because Kevin Green, to him, this is all about football. Every bit of strategy has got to be a football analogy. Yeah, so we have... And McMichael is explaining tag team psychology to Kevin Green. Think about that. Yeah, he did a better job explaining tag team psychology than probably Hugh Morris did in his entire run at the uh, <laughs> WWE Developmental. So the payoff here was they were decided they could not get along, they could not see eye to eye, they needed a coach. And then Green was looking, eating a Slim Jim. They said, hey... Randy Savage is banned from wrestling, but maybe we can get him to be our coach. That's right. It cannot be denied. These two men are wacky. They're very, very wacky. And and Mongo, when he's got a whiteboard, and he draws the ring, mm. and he puts two X's in one corner and two O's in another corner. That's right. And he goes, so what we want to do is make sure an X never ends up over there by those two O's. That's right. And I was like, huh. Huh. He's right. Hmm. This guy understands tag team wrestling. Kevin Green. Kevin Green's too stupid. He's talking about a scrimmage. No, he's talking about, okay, they, they can't get their ball over to our goal line. Yes. And by the way. Why didn't Mongo just explain it in football terms? Just go, the middle of the ring is the goal line, so never end up on the other side of that goal line. Because mm -hmm. then you're in their corner, right? I don't know a goddamn thing about football. Why didn't Mongo think of this? By the way, we've glossed over this for the last three weeks. Kevin Green. The rat tail. Is it really that big a deal? <laughs> it is to some it's, people, Vinny. It's to uh, uh, a certain person on the board. It's like one guy who's very passionate about right, it. Right, he's very passionate about it. But he has a normal haircut and then like a 12-inch rat tail. You know what's amazing about it? I'm going to tell you. Because there is one thing amazing about this rat tail. Mm -hmm. So your average person, this is scientific fact, you lose about 100 hairs a day on average. And your hair will fall out, and then the follicle is going to go into like a, a dormant, dormant phase state. for a while. Sure. And then hair starts growing again. Oh, oh good. So, <laughs> maybe not for you, Vinny. Ah. But my, my point is, his rat tail looks like it's made up of about 200 hairs. Okay. How the fuck did it get that long without every single one of those hairs falling out and going into a dormant stage? <laughs> You know what I mean? No. That's what amazes me about his rat tail. It's so thin. I'm sure it's braided, Brian. I can't believe you just thought to a rat tail. Why don't you get an expert on the phone oh and God. call Lance? I should ask him. No, Lance's rat tail was more like a I'm just kidding. like a no, cat. It's fair. Like a cat when it gets scared. Sure. It was a little fluffy. Sure. It was pretty thick. It wasn't like green. His rat tail was literally like 100 hairs. I think it's braided, Brian. See, this is why... Doesn't matter. This is why we didn't mention it, because I remember when this promo started, I thought, okay, I'm going to watch this fucking rat tail now, because it's that one guy will get it mad. Right. Then I saw it, I was looking at it, I was like, does he have it? Did he cut it off? Right. It's very hard to miss. And then he turned around, I was like, uh, this this razor thin line going on his back. I'm like, okay, he's yeah. got a rat tail. All right. Yeah. And no, it did not grow out or fall out or anything. Steiner versus Sting and Lex Luger. 
the announcers, who by this point were Bobby Heenan and uh, Eric Bischoff, we got a phone call from Randy Savage. This was phony. <laughs> he said, I am reading my notice in WCW. It says I am banned from wrestling on TV. I am banned from wrestling on pay-per-view. And I am banned from competing for titles. And that's all bad. But it doesn't say anything about coaching. And I'd be happy to coach but Michael and Green. He did not like this news. So they had the actual phone, like a... Uh, a corded phone. Yeah, a landline corded phone between them. And Bischoff had the receiver, or the headset, what's it called? I don't even know what it's receiver. called anymore. Receiver? The, the, the gimmick where you put some buttons. No, no, they probably hold it to your head. That's uh, the handle. The handle. What the I don't fuck know. are you talking about he on the phone? Bobby was actually on the phone. Yeah, telephone. But, but he could hear Savage before he got on the phone. Right. Well, it's probably piped over the house mic. I see. Yeah. Then why did Bobby have to yell at him on the phone? Because he had to talk to Savage. This was phony. <laughs> <laughs> wow, I just explained exactly why. They pipe in the phone over the, the Let's go loudspeakers. Let's back and look over stuff that did not make Craig say this was phony. He is just going to yell really <laughs> loud in the, uh, in the building did, uh, and Savage is going to hear him. Not phony. Uh, Vince, yeah. stop it. <laughs> You're wasting time. Hey, he wasn't a fish. <laughs> he was not a fish. Disco Inferno, quitting, not phony. All right. Um, I did like when he's he's stammering and ranting and, ple- and begging Savage to please stay home. Yes. And there's a brief pause, and then all of a sudden you hear Randy Savage scream, that's the weakest thing I've ever heard in my entire life. Yes. It was awesome. So if I haven't mentioned this, I love the Steiners. Mm-hmm. Just suplexing whatever is in their path. It was good, but it was very rushed. It was. It was this was, God forbid had we had to hours. get that Hugh Morris match in. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So Sting and Lex kept going for the finishers, and the Steiners kept breaking it up. They started brawling on the floor, and suddenly Lex, who had earlier accused the Steiners of fighting dirty by trying to suplex on the floor, on the floor Lex tried to suplex on the floor. He's as evil as they are. That got broken up, and then Sting actually tried a pile driver on the floor. And he was raking eyes. And he was raking eyes. They're all pissed at each other. But Rick backdrops his way free, and then Giant appears. And he gives Rick Steiner the gentlest chokeslam ever on the floor. <laughs> Why even bother? The fucking table is right there. I, I don't know. And he comes down, and he grabs the ropes just as Scott was hitting them. So Scott tumbles out to the floor. So now it's down to Giant and Lex. And Giant goes to murder Lex Luger. But Lex is able to hold his own for a few seconds. Then Sting and Scott return. Did you notice when the Giant went after Lex... He attempted the first KO punch of his career. I did not notice that. Yeah, and he missed. Thank that's, God for Lex. That's right. But he did the whole thing. He just had the big ham-like fist, and he just swung at the dude's head, and he ducked. So Sting and Lex and Scott were able to take care of the giant. They whipped Lex into him, and Lex at the metal elbow of death. Giant took the bump over the ropes to the floor, but landed on his feet and had to be pulled away by Jimmy Hart. And Giant was so scary, the fans were cheering as the, the baby faces triple teamed him into a draw. That's right. This was an achievement. This is a great, great segment. You know, sometimes you can do three on one advantage baby faces and it works. Yeah, when but it's it, a giant. Well, it, it has to be a situation where the baby faces have just been fucked over and over again, usually with a man disadvantage, and finally it's their chance to have the advantage. And if you do it the right way, everybody's going to cheer. It's not a hard and fast rule that anytime it's three on one advantage, baby faces, it sucks. Now, most of the time it is because people don't set it up right, but it is possible to make it work. And it fucking worked here. There's nothing better than Paul White losing his mind. Yes. And this, well, just, Ric Flair losing his mind. Well, him just yelling and screaming and just spittle flying from his face while he's yelling. He's. Terrifying. (laughs) (laughs) I don't go that far. Oh, I don't know. (laughs) An angry giant is pretty terrifying. That's true. See, the announcers will start to wrap up the show when Razor Ramon appears in his all-denim outfit. He begins to intimidate Bischoff until Sting appears to make the save. Let's think about this. Sting has to worry about the tag team titles. He's got to worry about fighting the Steiners, who are scary enough on their own. He's got to fight the giant. He's also got a big match coming against coming up against Steven Regal. And I assume he still hates Ric Flair. With all that on his plate, he still steps up to defend WCW from the Invader. That's right. Best hero ever. He says, look, I hear you calling out calling out me, saying bad things about me and my friends. 
You're coming out for three of WCW's best, but right now there's one of you and one of me. Let's just fight right now. Razor said, this is not an exact not an exact quote, but it's close. You're not the boss of me. <laughs> he flicked his toothpick in Sting's face. Sting slapped him, and security interrupted before Razor could fire back, and ran the Razor promised a big surprise for next week. This is also a great angle. They teased the fight but didn't deliver it, and they ended on a cliffhanger to get everyone turning back in seven days. I thought the exact same thing. This is great this, TV. This, when was the last time that they built up a pay-per-view and you were excited to actually see the pay-per-view? I don't think... I can't even remember the last time when we were watching Nitro. Like, usually we'll sometimes watch it because we heard, like, the Doomsday Cage match was terrible. Mm-hmm. But, I mean, none of us are ever like, okay, we gotta watch this pay-per-view. It's always like, we gotta watch the main event because we should, or this match sounds terrible. When's the last time it actually sounded like fun that this pay-per-view is coming up? This is the first time that they've done a really, really good job building up a pay-per-view and make it sound interesting. And yes, they they have done a great job. They they did not overexpose Razor. He did a very, very brief appearance. And think about this, too. They were in the middle of a ratings war. And so they would always freak out and do crazy shit. So last week, they had two very brief appearances by Scott Hall. And the rating for that show was like, it beat Raw by almost a full point, if I recall correctly. So like, it was a huge success, Scott Hall on on Nitro. So Eric Bischoff could have very easily said, holy shit, well, we got to get Nash on the show. We got to have Hall in eight segments. I mean, we got to just like get him all over the show because this is working. Nope. He did not even mention the guy. He did not even have the guy on the show one time. He held it off until the very, very, very end. And the only reason he was there was to tease that there was going to be somebody else coming next week. It was amazing restraint from this guy. But yeah, this was uh, this was much, much better than usual in, in at least that sense. The show itself, whew, there was some bad shit on this show. It was a struggle to get through. <laughs> Yeah, it was sure. not their best. Better than last week. Oh, Jesus Christ, it was better than last week. All right. We are at war. Ladies and gentlemen, www.frisco-com has finally arrived. Johnny Badass walking through the bar with his little tap out shirt on. What the hell is that shit? Doing your little jujitsu, getting focused and shit. You ain't great for bastards. Cock darn Jumbo. Out of control. Needless to say, shit hit the fan. We walking out on Dr. Phil, he shit his shit. I heard the chicken say. Man, bitch. Now. We got bumper stickers? Yes, sir, we got bumper stickers. I'm pulling on my dog. There you go, put it right on there. I'm pulling on my dog. I don't want to blame me. I drive the dog, huh? Four too soft, step too heavy. Hop in my dodge and drive to the levy. I drive for dog. Drive for dog. Come on. Nitro. There's a whole thread on the board of Mark Briscoe promos. Oh, good. I haven't seen it. Oh, it's excellent. He's amazing. He is so amazing. So, Nitro, Tony Schiavone and Larry Zabisco are hyping up the card, and they mentioned if you stay tuned, everyone, you'll get to see Ric Flair and Arn Anderson take on Joe Gomez and the Renegade. <laughs> I cursed out loud when they said this. <laughs> Thankfully, they had a plan. Hey, listen, mm-hmm. say what you will about this show, but they are doing a great job doing a slow build episodic storyline with Hall and Nash. Yeah. Opened with a recap. Mm-hmm. Hall saying something big's coming this week. Shivani says, hey, it's this week. And they held it off till the end of the show. That's right. Two full minutes. That's it. Mm-hmm. They're doing a hell of a job. Opener was Booker T versus Scott Steiner. Or as Tony Shivani said, and I quote, two muscle men going at it. <laughs> he is not wrong. No. These were two muscle men, and they were going at it. The thing that they have not changed Booker T's music in 19 years or more. <laughs> oh, they never can now. No, it's great. It has to be great. In fact, 
when you think of all the music they've changed just a little bit, like even Goldberg in WWE didn't have the exact same thing. Kane, Undertaker. Kane, but, but Booker T was in WCW. And as far as I can tell, they're still using, still using the exact same song. Yeah. These two were actually a tag team in TNA together. Steiner and Booker T? Yeah. Wow. They put their differences aside. To steal money from Dixie Carter. A cause I can fully support, by the way. Oh, wow. Anyway, they had a great match. They beat the hell out of each other. Mm-hmm. They threw each other around. Mm-hmm. And then Scott hit an overhead belly-to-belly and just pinned him. That's right. <laughs> it was like a sporting event. It is. Yes. No build, and no... No heel, no face. No finishing move. Two guys working hard to win. Yep, and then one guy did a move and got the pinfall. And, and Booker T's life bar was empty. This was great. And he couldn't kick out. I thought it odd that Booker T went for a top rope splash instead of the Harlem hangover. Yeah. And no water in the pool. You can't always jump and land on your ass. I'll say. Gene Oakland was interviewing Steiner on the ramp after the break. About their big match next week. At uh, uh, the pay-per-view, I think. Mm. Ah. With Fire and Ice. I just know he says next week, so I don't know if it's on the pay-per-view or Nitro. But well, that's true. Monday, Sunday's the next There week. must be a winner. Yeah. Steiner's versus Fire and Ice. Hey, if you had told me that like a month ago, I would have laughed with you. But they had two matches on Nitro, and they were both great. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So, uh, Deborah McMichael interrupted and said she needed to talk about her husband. Scott said, she looks highly upset, Gene. Go ahead. And he walked away. Just- Gotta say, fire and ice, they, they killed off Norton, which is too bad. They killed them both off last they, week. They killed, uh, yeah. they killed Ice Train off like a week before. It's Granted, if you're going to kill one of them, Ice Train should have been killed. But yes, they were both dead. So, Debra explains that she's very wor- worried about her husband and Kevin Green. She's upset that Steven might go a little crazy. Yes. And hurt Flair permanently. Somebody. She- and she felt bad about this because it was her fault. So Oakland is trying to calm, uh, calm her down, saying none of this is her fault. Flair is just a dick. And she still didn't want to see Flair get hurt over something so silly. She wanted Oakland to set up a meeting so they could get the match canceled. <laughs> this may well have been Whitney. <laughs> That's all I could think. Hey, we have to have a match. Look, can we just talk about it? It's going to work it <laughs> so out. I can't just hear her saying that. <laughs> I can't do. Jim Powers versus Diamond Dallas Page. Jim Powers was enormous here. Not, Not as good as Scott Steiner. No, Steiner's bigger, but... And better. Yes, that is a fact. <laughs> That's a, a measurable fact. Scott Steiner was a better wrestler than Jim Powers. But I'm sure if I went back and watched the Young Stallions, it was the 1980s, everyone was huge, but he couldn't have been this big then. He was giant. So Paige's Battle Bowl ring was on the line. What a mm. prestigious championship that is. Zabisco was going off on a great rant about football players who had tried to wrestle in the past and gotten embarrassed. I thought that Deborah had been sent out by her cowardly husband to pull right. out of the match. That's right. And uh, he was also referring to Paige as Diamond, like it was his first name. <laughs> yeah. Dallas is his middle name. That's right. And Powers made his comeback, and Paige him with the Diamond Cutter for the win. This was fine. And a very wacky Kevin Sullivan, Crispin Wall video package. Why are you waving him off, Craig? I have nothing to say about that match. No. I mean, he made another hand gesture that I thought but I had something to say. Then he made a second hand gesture and confirming he had nothing to say. Yeah. Thank, Thank God we've gone over this. Thanks for calling attention to it. Well, you were so vigorously waving that I had to. Craig just made a very lewd gesture. It's uh, theater of the mind, Brian. Wow. So we had a very wacky Kevin Sullivan and Chris Benoit video package, and the key here is that they had a match coming up, and Arn Anderson had promised he would not interfere. I thought the key was Lee Marshall made an appearance. That's also key. They had a Conan video package. I don't know what song they used originally, but I guarantee you it was not this one. Conan's throwing guys around in the ring as we are listening to 1970s soft rock. <laughs> FM in the morning. So, then Oakland interviews Conan in the locker room. Conan plugs his upcoming match against El Gato, a legend in South America. <laughs> Played by legendary South American Pat Tanaka. Oh, really? <laughs> yeah. Didn't know that. <laughs> it was a short promo. Sting versus Ming. Sting versus Ming. Yeah. They did I was a... so disappointed. Why is that? 
It just went like three minutes, well, and then Sting mm-hmm. just submitted him. This is a show full of three-minute matches. I yeah, just like, until fucking Public Enemy had to go out there and, and have the shittiest match ever for three hours. Uh, yes, that is a fact. I just like that Sting, and maybe it's because I have been watching modern era WWE for so long, where they want everyone to do the same finishing sequence every time. But you watch Sting on Nitro, and even when you know he's going to win, you don't always know how. Sometimes he wins with a wacky cradle, and sometimes he wins with that... Weird pile driver thing, thing he used on Big Bubba or whatever. And here, Ming goes up top. Sting knocks him off. Ming's on his belly. And Sting, without turning him over, managed to put him in the scorpion and Ming taps out. And the funniest thing was, Shivani suggested that he wouldn't be able to get the hold on because he didn't flip him over and he wasn't in position. And then two seconds later, he taps. Yes. Making Shivani look like a complete fool. On the first time. Now well, stuff happens. Oakland met with Deborah and Bobby Heenan in the hallways backstage. Heenan and Deborah had probably been talking to Flair all week anyway, which is a great line. He led her into Flair's locker room. They went inside. Heenan slammed the door. Deborah screamed. Seconds later, she came out being chased away by Liz and Woman. And then Gomez and Renegade were there. And Flair and Anderson zoomed out and destroyed them. It was all very weird. I just thought it was great that. They attack Joe Gomez, a violent attack. The security is there immediately to break it up. Completely unlike Impact, where people beat the shit out of each other for two hours backstage. And I guess because finances are in the shape they're in, there is no security. And finally, a couple geeks come and break it up. But this looked like a violent, unrepentant attack. And thankfully, there was security there to save somebody's life. This is good. Uh, let's see. Dave Taylor versus Jim Duggan. I got to talk about this. <laughs> After nine months, Hacksaw Jim Duggan finally actually beat somebody with his taped fist. And Dave Taylor took the best bump ever. Now, seeing as that was taped fist actually is effective, I have finally discovered because he finally hit somebody with it. I still don't know why he doesn't just tape his fist in advance. Because the announcers made it clear it's legal. So this dumb shit has been coming out for nine months with his tape in his trousers. And when he's in deep shit, he tries to take it out and rapidly tape his fist. It failed for eight straight months. Finally, he has achieved. So I congratulate him for that. But he's an idiot. Two things. I'm pretty sure he used it on Ming in one. On one of these shows. I don't think so. Two, more important. The way he set this up was, and keep in mind, there's only like a two-minute match. He charges into the corner, and Dave Taylor dodges. And after he dodges, he points it at his brain, as if to say, ha-ha, I outsmarted Jim Duggan. Hmm. By moving. By dodging his charge. What a feat that was. But then Duggan threw on the brakes. And then he, yes, reached into his trunks and taped up his fist. And there's no good reason you wouldn't do this before. It doesn't make any sense. That's what happened. Clips of Dean Malenko working in WCW and Rey Mysterio Jr. working in Mexico. The graphic that said this happened on Nitro two weeks ago. WCW, everyone. (laughs) WCW. I believe it said they would then meet at the Great American Bash. Gene Oakland interviewed Jimmy Hart and Big Bubba, who was still carrying around John Tenta's hair. Wasn't his bash like a legendarily great show? Somebody else mentioned that. I never saw it. Uh, and off the top of my head, I only know what happened to the main event. But some, somebody else mentioned it was like a, their, a, a, an all-time great show. So they, we went over uh, Tenta's promo from last week where he said he was not a fish. And then Bubba botched his line. <laughs> so was he dumb promo anyway, and then led to this dumb promo. And he vowed to leave Tenta laying like a beached whale. Scott Norton did a very short promo on the ramp. Just say he was going to take the Giant out. And then Giant versus Scott Norton was a very fun two minutes. They beat the hell out of each other. Went outside. Norton missed a charge and hit the post. Giant chokeslammed him on the floor. I bet that sucked. Then rolled him inside and won. 
Yeah, this choke slam on the floor was way better than the one they did on uh, on Steiner. Last oh, the, week. the Rick Steiner one. Yeah, yeah, that was that was fake. <laughs> Very fake. Yes. Also, they got the timing right for the hour two mark this time. Uh, Norton was in the ring. Giant had not yet entered the ring, and there was lots of explosions and uh, and uh, ballyhoo uh, for the uh, pyro and ballyhoo. That's right for the uh, entrance of the giant. So they actually hit their mark this time. Whereas last week they were in the middle of a match. Purely coincident, I'm sure. I'm sure. So uh, after the match, Giant went after Norton, but Lex Luger ran out and attacked him. Luger, of course, getting the title shot at the bash. And uh, they brawled, and Giant went to choke slam him through the dinner table, but Luger fought him off with a low blow. Started whacking him with some of the silver until the rest of the Dungeon of Doom chased him off. And it took about five seconds for the giant to recover because he's the fucking giant. And he screamed and went up at the aisle after Luger. Meanwhile, Luger went to the announce desk. He said he had proven the giant could feel pain. The rule book was out the window now. He promised more surprises at the Great American Bash. Billy Kidman versus Steven Regal. <laughs> I, could not, I didn't know he was here this early, but apparently he was. I had totally forgotten that he ever existed before the flock. Yeah, he was around for about a year before they gave him a flock gig. He came out, and uh, I mean this in the nicest way possible, but he looked like a complete dweeb. And it, Regal beat him like a dweeb. He beat his ass. Kibben made a Dolph Ziggler-level comeback as fast as humanly possible. <laughs> yes. Regal suplexed him on his head and then submitted him. With a Boston Crab, yes. This match was awesome. Barry, you were talking about Jimmy Powers, how huge he was. Billy Kidman was not. No. Until he got to WWE, and then he bulked Magically, up. Magically, he gained weight, yeah. So this match also went like a minute, and then Sting ran out to attack Regal, and there was way too much stuff happening too quickly on the show. <laughs> it was a bunch of two-minute matches with run-ins afterwards. And Sting dropped Regal, and then he left. That really annoyed me, actually. And then time stood still. After the break, Eric Bischoff noted there is so much going on. So, apparently, to put a stop to things going on, the Nasty Boys wrestled Public Enemy. Was, yeah. <sighs> What's there to even say? This was they their this was their third match. Wrestled. <laughs> this was their third match. I'm not sure they're done yet. Forever. And it's never been good. For ever. And somebody thought, let's put them on again. This feud will never end. I'm, no. Like I'm trying I mean to, it's done now for sure, but I'm trying to think of who the best guy was here. It'd be Rocco Rock. And then a very steep drop off. <laughs> and then the Nazis were about the same. Uh-huh. And then a steep, steep drop off. Nah, well, to be fair, mm-hmm. a couple of things. Grunge did break his hand the night before. All right. And so he was working with a broken hand in a cast. And Bischoff is sitting there talking about how we got so many tough guys here. They don't take time off for broken bones. I was like, this looks like bullshit in hindsight. And I will say, Knobs looked pretty good. He did this pile driver on. on uh, who was it on? It was Grunge. It yeah. was on Grunge. And he fucking lifts him up completely vertically upside down, stands there for a second, <laughs> just pile drives him on his head. And meanwhile, they cut the commercial and the announcers are busy talking about Mongo. Well, that's true. That was the only good spot in the match. He does this pile driver. They go to break. And when they come back from break, Public Enemy is winning on them. Yeah. And it just went This went for on goddamn ever. And on and on and on. Public Enemy learned here that... And then they did the Orton versus Sheamus finish. Yeah, that's just a dumb DQ. Public Enemy learned that when I mean, you're a wacky, dancing, fat guy, sometimes it works in a bingo hall and doesn't work in the arena. A big, giant arena. The WCW crowd did not get into their dancing. Actual dialogue from the announcers. This is ugly. Grunge's timing is just off tonight. Yes. This got five times as much time as any match on the show up to this point. And nothing on Raw was worse than this. No. All year. No, you're right. This is terrible. Um, and then finally, there was just a lame DQ. I uh, here I, I noted minus two stars. Maybe even worse than that. I don't even think Dave gave it minus two stars at the time, which is astonishing. It was awful. Had a Hulk Hogan video package. Our weekly Hulk Hogan is awesome video package. Just to remind everyone, he's still employed. Well. Without actually putting him on TV. Then we got a video package recapping the football players versus horseman feud. The generic music they pumped in here. I've forgotten, but I still wrote it. I, I, I wrote, 
My God, the generic music they pumped in here and then didn't describe it at all. Because I'm bad at my job. I don't remember it at all. Because if you would have described music, this would have come across in your writing. I could have put some kind of genre. Yeah, it's uh, the true. other one I know was 70s rock. Sure. Yeah, I, right. I, I don't know what this was. Luger and Sting versus Flair and Anderson. Oh, dude, what about the Mongo and Green training video? I just talked oh, about it. Oh, I thought you were talking it. about the Hogan video music. Yes, the, the training video. This was the first time I had buffering issues. I could only imagine that oh, thousands of people around the country were watching this training video all at the same time. It must have been. Kevin Green totally reminds me of Mojo Raleigh. Yes, actually. Yeah. He's totally Mojo Raleigh. And when they had Randy Savage show up at the school <laughs> and give them advice, mm. such as, you can never be too intense, I was like, what a tragedy that this man is dead. And in all those years that he was alive, they never hired this guy to give advice to the youngsters in, in WWE Developmental. I saw 30 seconds of Randy Savage giving advice to these two guys, and it was like, I don't even want to wrestle, but I would have paid to go to Randy Savage's wrestling school. Imagine I can him, only imagine. Imagine him on Tough Enough. Holy oh, shit. That would have been great. That would have yeah. been great. So I missed Cena talking during his en- entrance, but I did not miss Flair talking during his. Yeah, wait, wait, one thing real quick. You saw Randy Savage before he passed away. Where he like shaved his head and he had a big ass big white fucking white beard. Yeah. yeah. He'd have been so awesome. Not tough enough. Yeah. He was crazy when he was young, but imagine like an old, grizzled, angry, gray bearded Randy Savage. That'd have been the grisliest thing ever. <laughs> Damn it. Ah, sad. He went too young. So Flair pulled the camera close. He gestured toward woman. He gestured toward Liz and let us all know, quote, long-legged women make great lovers. <laughs> mm-hmm. Yeah. See, Flair, he's just like me. Loves all women. As long as they have long legs, apparently. Sure. They'd be taller than you, though. I don't give a fuck. I see. So uh, I don't want to alarm you, but Ric Flair took a thousand press slams in this match. Hmm. Yeah. The real story of this match was Heenan on commentary. He was screaming that Flair's out of control. He needs to calm down. Him and Arn are fucking everything up. About to have a heart attack. Great analysis of the match. He kept wanting to go down to ringside to help. Oh my God, we're five days away. Quit taking so much punishment. He was awesome. This was Heenan at his best. Really, this and last week. Yes. Heenan, when he has a rooting interest and is discussing strategy and uh, technique and execution, great. So, let's see. They're having a fun TV match. Lex got the hot tag. He was running wild. And then Giant came out to kill him. Had been a fun match up to that point. And then Sting uh, joined in. And Scott Steiner also joined in. Don't know where he even came from. They began to whack the Giant with wooden chairs, one of which caught him right in the forehead. Yes. That looked so bad. Well, not only that, it hit him in the forehead and then gl- glanced off his nose. Oh, God, yeah. I just love that we've talked about this before, that sometimes... Three men can attack one man, and the one man is still the bad guy. And that's what the giant was. The giant's killed so many men that three men put in a beating on him. With weapons. Yes, everybody's going crazy. Except they hit him with one too many chair shots, and suddenly he remembered he was Godzilla. And he just starts going batshit crazy, and all the baby faces just like back off like, holy shit. Okay. Sorry. Maybe you had to hit him in the face with a chair. Yeah. So, Jimmy Hart, thank goodness, was there to drag Giant away before he actually killed someone. Just the best monster you ever saw, this Giant. And then, he cut this great promo on Lex Luger. Rookie year Giant was amazing. He was great. Amazing. Promised that there'd be uh, no rules in Baltimore, and he's going to make sure Lex is dragged away on the stretcher. Promised. Yes. I promise you will leave on a stretcher. Lex could bring all the chairs he wanted, he said. This is awesome. They went to the announce desk. Heenan was also awesome, having a great tantrum about how he had no beef with Savage. Savage was not going to put his dirty hands on Heenan. He didn't deserve any of this. And out of the corner of his eye, he caught Razor Ramon coming and he just bailed. <laughs> That's right. As you mentioned, by the way, there was a man in pink with a war is on sign. Yeah. Who looked exactly like Ryzik. Those the, That couple used to go to all the pay-per-view shows huh. for WWE. 
And for whatever reason, they were at a WCW show. How about that? You can still see them today. They they pop up from time to time wearing the same outfit. Pretty much. So Hall shows up. And he's there, and uh, Bischoff sees him coming and says, look, I don't want any trouble, but I do want to know what your big surprise is. It's all cocky now. Like, oh, you promised a big surprise. I don't see him. And then Diesel appeared behind him. Yes. This is another famous promo. As Diesel famously said, this is where the big boys play. Look at the adjective, play. (laughs) This means, I, I didn't know this. 20 years later, I vividly remember both these promos, but I don't remember they were back-to-back weeks. We got I'm not a fish, and look at the adjective in eight days. Look at the adjective, play. Yeah, it's a verb. (laughs) It's just classic. That's the joke. Well, I didn't know if you got the joke or not. So he said WCW still didn't have three men to face them. He buried the company, said, watching WCW is like listening to Marge Schott read Mein Kampf. What an idiot. What? <laughs> He's just an idiot. I get the Marge Shot reference. Yes. Ryan, I don't know if you know this. Marge Shot was a Major League Baseball owner who was a terrible person and had a large collection of Nazi memorabilia. But what? <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, he had to speak in terms that the wrestling fans would understand. I guess. I guess. He buried all of WCW's old stars, said Hogan was off making another episode of Blunder in Paradise. Wow. That's 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 harsh fighting words right there. <laughs> and Bischoff promised if they showed up at the Great American Bash in six days, he would uh, do all he could to get them a fight by then. He dared them to show up. And they said, hey, they love us in Baltimore. One of the measuring stick just changed around here. And that was that. And uh, this show would have been much better with half as many matches, and they went twice as long, except that whole public enemy bullshit. But uh, this last segment was a winner. I got to say that um, aside from his adjective line... Nash was way better here than Hall was the last two weeks. Yes. I don't know what was up with Hall. Maybe he was always a terrible promo and he got better when he got in the NWO or something like that. I don't know, but Nash's promo was way better than Hall's recent promos. And it was funny because for this, for I guess the third time now, the first week Hall comes out and like dead silence, except for the people in the crowd when he walked right past him. They cheered. But when he, when he got into the ring, it was like everybody was quiet. And then last week comes out again, and they're quiet again. And then Nash comes out this week, and guess what? They're quiet. Well, I have a theory on that. Well, I'm going to tell you my theory, then you can tell me yours. Okay. WCW at the time did not suck. And in fact, it was arguably, and this is arguable, I'd have to go watch some of those Raws, but the 1996 Raws are not renowned as the best Raws of all time. It was arguably the more exciting show. It was beating them in the ratings. And so I think the WCW fans that were there at the time, they were fans of WCW. And they were not any of these WWE fuckers showing up and bearing their television show. It would be like if... This is a terrible analogy. It's, it's, it's the worst, but it's the closest I can come up with. It would be like if you sent... I'm trying to think of somebody who was in the position of Hall and Nash when they left. Magnus and James Storm. Bobby Roode. James Storm and, and Bobby Roode, maybe. If they showed up on WWE today, it's not like the people would go batshit crazy that, oh my God, these TNA invaders are here. This is the greatest angle of all time. They would probably be met with a great deal of apathy. And that was the way it was here when they showed up on this show. It was like, uh, we don't like that company, and we don't like you two. And you're making fun of all this stuff we love, so fuck off and go home. It's kind of what it seemed like the reaction was from these people. My thing was, why in the world was Kevin Nash wearing a ball cap? I don't know. (laughs) That's what you got out of this 19 (laughs) years later. He's wearing a ball cap. (laughs) When people don't want to be noticed, they wear a ball cap and... Bring it down over their face. It's hard to not notice Kevin Nash. They don't even have the big screens there in WCW. Nobody could have seen him. Huh. That's an interesting theory. Wasn't well, so the one that we had a couple of months ago where we were talking about something and Craig brought up something completely random that actually wasn't random, but it sure sounded random. 
some well that's a very specific description no you remember know, it was Brian? like some some bar in in something or other Craig, do you have any idea what he's talking about we no. were talking about something and you brought up a famous bar that somebody owned eh, it doesn't matter you just oh gonna... oh it's prince, prince. Yeah. <laughs> that's right <laughs> that's right yeah it's a famous thing so. craig are you really gonna get mad at me because i thought that in one of the most famous angles of all time 19 years later your your big takeaway was he wore a hat What do you want me to say? <laughs> I'm just wondering. I don't care. Vinny laughed too. Why don't you ever get mad at him? Vinny's my right home tonight. <laughs> oh, wow. Otherwise, he'd have left you here, Vinny. If he'd... I'm his right home, Brian. I'm just saying, if it were the other way around, you'd be sleeping on the couch again. I'm so confused now. Anyway. It doesn't matter. This show, we should have stopped two minutes ago. We're hey. Perfectly fine show, we have stopped two minutes ago. Great American Bash is great. Have you even seen what happens to Bischoff, Vinny, since you never saw that pay-per-view? Actually, I did see that. Okay. That, should we look, run down that card? I can read the matches. I don't want to give any spoilers. Well, I don't want to give spoilers. If you have the matches ready. We got Rocco Rock versus Jerry Sags. We will skip that. <laughs> I've seen enough of those two men. Thankfully, it went one minute and 46 seconds. VK, there's three dark matches, believe it or not. VK Wall Street versus Jim Powers. And Disco Inferno against Jim Duggan. Uh, the match, we had the Steiners versus Fire and Ice, which went 10 minutes, which sounds good. Conan versus El Gato, which went 6 minutes. DDP versus Bagwell, which went 10 minutes. Dean Malenko versus Rey Mysterio Jr., which went 17 minutes. Can you imagine they gave those guys 17 minutes? It's John. Amazing. What? It is amazing. John Tenta versus Big Bubba Rogers. Chris Benoit versus Kevin Sullivan. Falls count anywhere. That okay, was awesome. That I have seen. That is awesome. I do remember that being awesome. Yeah. It's only 10 minutes. Yeah, it's 10 minutes of awesome. It's 10 minutes because you can't believe they're alive by the end of it. And you know, the, what, I, what I think is the greatest match in the history of WCW, which was the Rey Mysterio versus... Who do you face in that mask match? Eddie Guerrero? I think it was Ray versus Eddie. At Halloween Havoc? Yeah. That was Ray and Eddie. 11 minutes. Yeah. Holy shit, that match was awesome. Yes, it is. Benoit, oh yeah, yeah, yeah. Sting versus Lord Steven Regal in 16 minutes. Flair and Arn versus Kevin Green and Steve McMichael. 20 minutes. Whoa. And then the Giant versus Lex Luger, which went 10. Actually, 9-21. They had no faith in these men, nor should they have. So there you go. That's uh, that's the show, everybody. We are at war. Let's play a song here. Maybe this will cheer you up. Because this segment was, I think, the worst pay-per-view in years. This pay-per-view was horrible. Horrible. It's hard to argue that kind of Horrible, wretched, vile, appalling, yeah. useless, atrocious, yeah. insulting, devoid of merit. God, this was horrible. Minus five star. No matter who you are. It was Jenna Maraska, everybody, the survivor chick, and Charmel. It was an endless design to show off her asshole. And these assholes that sent in these matches claiming they were minus five stars, they had no idea what they were in for in 2009. The only fucking thing missing from this was the Fire Russo chant. Jenna proceeded to do a lap dance on her face and pin her with her vagina. Great. There you go. Mm hmm. What a great match that was. That was worse than Brock's return. It really was. Yes. Everything about it was. All right, let's get going here. Nitro. Actually, this will make Vinny feel better. One more. Awful. He was so far into awful, he was wildly entertaining. There you go. Now you can go. Okay. The June 17th, 1996 edition of Monday Nitro. Tony Schiavone and Larry Zabisco opened the show. Talking about the Great American Bash and the blatant attack on Eric Bischoff carried out by the two unnamed men. 
Yeah, still shots of the Steiners defeating Fire and Ice, John Tenta defeating Big Bubba, Dean Malenko defeating Rey Mysterio Jr. They talked about Steve McMichael turning on Kevin Green and joining the Four Horsemen. And, of course, Chris Benoit had a fight with Kevin Sullivan. And they showed the angle with Holland Nash, where they confirmed they no longer worked for the WWF. And, boy, did they make that as plain as possible and also get it done with and out of the way as possible. And then Scott Hall proceeded, proceeded to cut the exact same promo. He has cut it every time he's been on TV since coming back to WCW. And Hall punched Bischoff in the gut, and then they cut away before the powerbomb. This was great. They said we'd have to wait until later to see it. And then they didn't even give it to us later. <laughs> yes. And they used the whole show to pump up the replay. The real story of this show. These guys pumped up this replay significantly more than they pumped up the original show. Mm-hmm. That's right. They were pushing and selling this replay in every segment for all they were worth. They'd even work it in between, you know, the commentaries would be talking back and forth, and then they would just casually work it in like it was conversation. Well, back in the day, people did buy replays in vast numbers. Oh, I'm not complaining or making fun of them. Well, yeah, they didn't have DVRs, so the best thing to do also true would be to catch it on Tuesday when I'm not doing nothing. Yeah. They did have VCRs. Yeah. But yes, this was this was very good. And how novel that they recapped all the matches from the pay-per-view. We've mm-hmm. been watching since September, and I think this is the first show they actually recapped a fucking pay-per-view. It really is. Think about that. <laughs> what a novel concept. Here's what you missed. Yes. So the opener here was Stevie Ray versus Rick Steiner. Stevie beat him up for a few minutes. Steiner hit one belly-to-belly suplex, one diving bulldog, and then Stevie missed a diving forearm, and Steiner hit a lariat for the win. I'm pretty sure Rick hit three moves in this whole match. What you neglected to mention was when Steiner hit the belly-to-belly, <laughs> almost killed him. He That's dropped right. him right on top of his head. You are correct. I didn't forget to write that down. I noticed it and did not write it down. Yes. And they did what they do on Raw all the time, which is the brother runs in, Booker runs in, they're double teaming Rick. And of course, if it were Raw, Scott would just run in and clear the ring or whatever. But not this time. They did something different. They go to kill Rick, and Scott runs in, and he throws his own body on top of his brother to protect him and also gets beat up. That's right. Mm -hmm. Great. That was very cool. Wow. Something different. The story of this show, as we go through all the matches, the story of the show, more so than selling the replay, was... Every match was different. You had a match here. We had a jobber match. We had a tag team match. We had an awesome wrestling match. We had a lucha style match. And then we had a match where one giant man beat the shit out of a man's injury the whole match, and it played into the finish. Every match was different. That is an excellent point. Unlike Raw, where every match was the same. That is a fact. Speaking of different... Disco Inferno versus Joe Gomez. Holy shit. Fat Fabio here. <laughs> this match could have been the opener in any flea market in America. It may still be. <laughs> That's a good point. So Joe Gomez was tall. He had long hair. He had a hell of a tan. Had a very basic match with hip tosses and arm drags. Another first week of wrestling school moves. Then Disco hit a neckbreaker, stopped to dance, and then they did the DiBiase one two three kid cover where he covered him very arrogantly, and Gomez cradled him for the win. And Disco didn't care. He noted his hair still looked good, mm-hmm. and he still got to dance. And we bitch all the time about how nobody cares about wins and losses anymore. It's Disco's fault. He started it. <laughs> it's different when the person who doesn't care about losing is an idiot bottom of the card heel. When it's supposed to be funny, it's great. Kind of. I thought it was great. Isn't there supposed to still be money on the line? For disco, dancing and having good hair is something you can't put a price tag on. Yeah. <laughs> Why well, doesn't just be a stripper then? <laughs> Save himself the pain. <laughs> well, I don't know. Well, he does live in Vegas. Yeah, Gomez is apparently still around. Hmm. Doing a match here or there. He's only a little bit older than than us. Yeah, I'm sure. He's 41. Yeah. You know when you look at a guy and you assign him a occupation just by looks alone? Male stripper. 
No, I looked at him and thought, Rody for the Eagles. <laughs> You well, are not wrong. Ironically, he was once Allen Iron Eagle. Whoa. Yeah. Huh. Gene Oakland interviewed Flair woman Elizabeth and Deborah McMichael backstage. And Flair was just bragging about his win and also taunting Randy Savage for a while. You know, Deborah McMichael was here in her gown. Same Deborah we saw for another decade with. Austin and with Jarrett and whatever. It was like she'd done this for years. She had been a woman in the crowd prior to this. This was her first time on television in a backstage segment as an actual pro wrestling performer. She did shockingly well. Arn Anderson and Chris Benoit versus the American Males. What a great match. <laughs> It was great because Arn Anderson's the best tag team wrestler maybe of all time. And Benoit was Benoit. So they let the males run wild, wild for a bit. And then eventually they cut them off. And it was awesome because the fans hated the American males. And they were very happy as the horsemen beat them up. And Arn was fine with this. Yeah. So Benoit would be in trouble. Arn would hit the ring illegally to cheat. Then he'd go back to the apron and Arn would do cheerleading. That's right. He was having the time of his life out there. Dude, being evil and being loved for it. They mostly just loved the horsemen. Benoit's face is all busted up, and they did this spot where he just took Bagwell to the corner and beat the shit out of him. He chopped him repeatedly and stomped the absolute hell out of him, and the place just went crazy. They just went with it. You guys love us? All right. We'll kill him. Shouldn't have said that. <laughs> yeah. So eventually he... The, the, the male's uh, comeback consisted of one double drop kick. And they immediately got cut off again. And Benoit dropped Riggs' stomach, fr stomach first across the ropes. Then he cradled him. And Arn, one last cheat, reached in and grabbed Riggs' foot to make sure he didn't kick out. And the horseman won. I, I do love when bad guys have the match won clean and they still want to cheat. Yes. Just because they're dicks. Because they're evil people. Although, we did have a rope finish in the next match, which I didn't get at all. We'll get to that. There was a point in there. There was a pretty major screw up where, um, where Bagwell was going to backslide Arn, and the thing was that the ref was supposed to come over and get Benoit out of the ring, but he was too busy looking at Scotty Riggs. So Benoit was had one foot in the ring and he was physically, audibly yelling at the ref to come over here. So Riggs could go in and dropkick Arn to complete the backslide. Yes. And the horseman cut a promo afterwards. Arn noted that people loved someone who says they're going to do something and then they do it. And then everyone cheered for him. And Benoit talked about his win over Sullivan. And uh, they were both actually total baby faces here. John Tenta versus Big Bubba. <laughs> oh, God. To cut to the chase... <laughs> 10-1. I thought it was okay. On the ropes. It's a decent mean guy match. Well, it wasn't. The thing is not even the match. It's afterwards. All right. Jimmy throws a loaded sock in for Tenta. And I, I hear a little bit of jingling. And so it's like, okay, well, this is supposed to be a sock full of quarters. Mm -hmm. So I figure, okay, well, you know, Bubba's going to hit him in the body with these quarters. This son of a bitch hits John Tenta right in the fucking eyeball yeah. and the face and the back of the head. Yeah. And he's hitting him so hard in the head that I'm thinking, okay, there's got to just be like a cork in there. And they're editing in sound effects because there's no way there's fucking quarters in this thing because he's destroying this man's fucking skull with this sock full of quarters. And so then he opens up the sock and he pours... 20 bucks worth of quarters onto the guy's body. Okay, go back and watch it. I'm going to tell you what they did. They probably had a piece of tape or something in the bottom of the sock. You could see that Bubba had actually had the sock wrapped in his hand with the quarters in his hand. So the quarters were in the sock, but he had the sock wrapped up. So none of the quarters were actually at the bottom of the sock. When I he was see. Yes, I, I, so when he dumped them out, he just let go of the 
quote unquote knot that he I had. was thinking more that that he would be just holding all the quarters and hit him with a knot. No, no, no. I see. Yeah, but it did sound pretty vicious. Oh God, he looked like he killed the poor guy. Yeah, I I, I believe this was in fact a magic trick, some sleight of hand from Big Bubba. Sure, hope so because that's a receipt I don't want. <laughs> yeah, I do not want to. I would not want to piss off John Tenta by hitting him repeatedly in the face because they are building to a sock full of quarters on a pole match yes. with these two fatties climbing a pole. Are they going to get their hair fixed before this? I hope not. <laughs> so we skipped over this. Ryan mentioned earlier Tenta, the baby face. He hits a power slam. He decides not to make a cover. He hits another power slam. Walks to the other side of Bubba. And gets the win with his feet on the ropes. It was critical to him that he won by cheating. I don't even know why. I don't either. I was I was flummoxed <sighs> is what I was. So I'm going to get Craig some honey. I'll take some honey. Don't get started. <laughs> Oakland interviewed Randy Savage. He was returning his TV. He was returning to TV tonight. Jesus, what's wrong with me? Randy Savage was returning to TV tonight (laughs) (laughs) because his suspension had been lifted for no reason. He said he was going to beat up Flair. He said he was, everything was fine with his mental state. Mm -hmm. I was very skeptical. Randy Savage and Ric Flair had an awesome match. You're, you're, you're. First of all. Yes, please do not gloss over this. Oh, no. First of all, Savage comes out and he goes after Heenan. And he chases Heenan down to the ring, and Heenan is moving as quickly as Michael Cole should have moved when Brock Lesnar came out. And then Savage is chasing him out of the ring, and Bobby Heenan took a great bump out of the ring. To get oh my to god, he vaulted oh, over the top rope. Bobby Heenan was such an athlete. He was great. Yeah. So Savage is done with that. Then they had this awesome match. God, what a match. First of all, it was all comedy, all comedy brawling early. Savage beating Flair's ass, and Flair selling like a goofball. And they went over and brawled over by the dinner table, and Savage hit him with all the silver and then literally tried to shove a candle up Flair's ass. He did. Yeah. There there was food. There was drink. If you want to have a great match, have a food fight or toss somebody in the water. It will never not be memorable. And that's what they did here. Yes. So eventually the comedy ceased and it was time to have a great wrestling match. And they did. And they did not do 8,000 finishers and 8,000 near falls. And no one chanted this was awesome. It was just two madmen trying to kill each other. So the ref gets bumped. Savage hits a low blow. He begins to drop elbows of doom repeatedly, trying to murder Ric Flair. And the women try to block his path, but Savage jumped right through them. Benoit and Arn Anderson ran down, tried to save Flair, but... Savage took care of them, and then the new horseman, Stephen Michael, appeared with his briefcase full of Savage's money, and he whacks Savage with the briefcase a few times, and he puts Flair on top, and Flair wins. This was awesome, and it was a great finish, because it immediately establishes the new horseman as a big deal. That's right. This was great pro wrestling. Because the horsemen weren't a big deal prior to this. Well, the new one. Yes. They, 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 he, he, right away. Although he did hit him right in the goddamn head with that briefcase as hard as he could. Twice. We're going to see a lot of that in the coming years. FYI. I'm still trying to wrap my head around the fact that Steve Mongo McMichael was a horseman. He was. Was this the plan from day one? I have no idea. I don't even remember. I have asked many times why Mongo was an announcer on Nitro. And I'm wondering if it's just because they said, we'll put this guy out there and have him be a crappy announcer. For the better part of a year. <laughs> I don't think they were thinking this so far So that we advanced. can turn him and make him a wrestler. No. Maybe they put him on commentary and they realized how much he sucked. So they figure he can't be much worse in the ring. Maybe not. He was an athlete. Oakland interviewed Jimmy Hart, Kevin Sullivan, and the Giant backstage. Sullivan was appalled that Arn Anderson had turned him at the pay-per-view. And he's talking about how pissed off he is to Arn. He's sure to mention you should all buy the replay to wake, watch my match. It's great. And then Giant asks, if the horsemen are the elite of the sport, why am I the champion and not them? He said, I will fight them all by myself. And I know I mentioned this a lot, but Rookie Giant was the man. He was great. He was great. We had still shots of Eric Bischoff getting powerbombed off the stage like Machine Gun Kelly. 
And uh, they did not help Eric walk backstage right afterwards. No, he was in the hospital selling injuries. Massive bruising. Massive bruising. And Shivani was filling in for him. Gene interviewed Rey Mysterio Jr. on the entrance ramp to immediately demonstrate how short Rey was. I want to know how Rey's voice is deeper in 1996 than it was in 2006. So he spoke a little English, he spoke a little Spanish, and he went to the ring. It was not much of a promo. He uh, got to the ring and he did a backflip off the top rope. Mm -hmm. Holy shit, did he land hard. <laughs> like, he didn't bend his knees at all when he landed. He just, like, landed with straight legs. And I thought, fuck. You know how jarring that is on your legs to just land like that? And I, I think he was already having a, a knee problem, but wasn't he surprised after this? And then I'm sitting there thinking, this guy, I'll never understand this. This guy was very, very small, but you know what? He was never going to get any taller. So the idea that he had to put on 50 pounds of muscle or whatever it was, that didn't do him one goddamn bit of good. Because even 50 pounds of muscle heavier, he was still the smallest fucking dude. Yes. And that's 50 extra pounds on his knees for all those years. He had a perfectly fine physique here. Yeah, he was small, but he had a good physique. And he was a high flyer, and he was athletic, and he put on all that weight later, and it just made life so much more difficult. He was still a great worker. But what a mistake, I think, as a small man. So, Rey Mysterio and Dean Malenko, they had a great match. The funny thing was, at least watching this in, in hindsight, 20 years later, when you think of cruiserweight matches these days or X-Division matches these days, you think of guys moving a million miles an hour the entire time. Not selling anything. Not selling anything. 10,000 dives. These guys had the exact same match anyone else in the show might have had, except that Rey's big spots were lucha dives. Sure. Mm -hmm. Otherwise, it was arm drags. It was backbreakers. It was a very, very good basic yeah. wrestling match that ended with a scorpion death drop. That's right. And it's, then there was a powerbomb of absolute doom. Yeah. Yeah, Ray, Ray landed harder on the powerbomb than he did on his backflip. That's for sure. So yeah, Malenko won. I believe he also won the pay-per-view, so he's 2-0 now. Ray performed a springboard diving Rana to the floor on Malenko. Yeah. It was unreal. There was one little goof there when it looked like Ray was going to superplex Malenko off the top rope, but instead he just did a backflip. I don't know what happened. He did a backflip. For why? Because he's a luchador. I don't know. Not an acceptable answer. Don't know. Let's see. Uh, Giant versus Scott Steiner. Scott tried some suplexes right away and Giant didn't budge. God, what a great... I, I can't even believe I'm saying this, but this was a really good match. The way they put it together. It just Steiner kept trying to do his one move, which is throw your ass, and it kept failing. And then he finally got the guy up, but the guy fell on him, thus hurting his bad ribs. And he sold and sold and sold and sold and sold his ribs. And then finally, at the end, he leaps to his feet, and he finally hits a suplex, and the place lost their shit. It was set up great. And the other part of it was great was, holy crap, this suplex. Oh, my God. Just exploded him out of his saw, head. For those of you who remember when Shawn Michaels first threw Marty Jannetty through the plate glass window, he was a heel solo act. And for maybe six months before he used the super kick as a finisher, he used what was later called the teardrop suplex, where he basically put himself in a headlock. He did a cross lift and threw the guy down onto his head. That's what Scott did here, only Scott wasn't wrestling 220-pound jobbers. Scott was wrestling a 7-foot, 450-pound man, and he threw him into the sky. It was so spectacular. What a bump by the Giant. The Giant took a giant bump for it, and Giant kicks out of that, the, the, this huge move, so Scott punches him for a bit. Giant had brought a wooden chair into the ring, so Scott tries to use that. He... Breaks this over Giant's Tried. head. He succeeded. Well, that's true. He used it. It didn't work. He breaks the chair over Giant's back and head. Ref was looking on. Doesn't care. Giant also doesn't care. Completely no souls it and hits a giant choke slam for the win. <laughs> this is how you book a monster 
champion. Yeah. He literally exploded a chair into Giant's head. And Giant just looked at him, growled, grabbed his neck, choke slammed him from 15 fucking feet in the air, and just pinned him. That's how you make a champion and a winner. It ain't hard. It uh, saddens me that the WWE has had Big Show for such a long time, and nothing has come even close to this run. It really is his first year. No, it's quite Vince hysterical. McMahon. Think about this: the Giant was fucking great. Now, now we've only seen him for a year, and he started to get heavy, and and who knows what else. But when he went to WWE in '99, I think it was, Vince said, "These fuckers, WCW." They don't know how to book a giant. I'm going to book this man like a real giant, like Andre. And three weeks later, Steve Austin pinned him clean in the middle of the ring. Hmm. And he never did as good a job as WCW did with the giant. This man who knew how to book a giant. Now, granted, Big Show, as much as I'm sick of seeing his matches of late, this guy's had an amazing career. Given his size and, and everything. I mean, man, this this guy should... I don't want to say he should be in a wheelchair right now, but holy smokes, at his size and, and doing this as long as he had and he's taken bumps and he's gained a ton of weight, the fact that he's still out there doing matches and bumping and all this craziness, that's very impressive. And he was very good when he was young. This match was so much fun. At the time, I remember Dave hated it. Thought, man, the show went off the cliff in the last half hour. Not in hindsight. I thought this was a really good main event. So it's time to determine the members of Team WCW for the Bash at the Beach match. Bash at the Beach match. I told you I don't need help with speech impediments. Before you explain how they chose, mm-hmm. I just want everyone to think back to how many times that WCW has granted a championship match to a guy who just lost, or like in the case of Miz and the Big Show, two men who have not won since WrestleMania. I think with one exception for the Miz, but they've been on extensive losing streaks, and they both end up in the title picture. How did they determine the six men that were in the running here, Vinny? Well, they claimed that the six finalists were chosen via win-loss record. That's right. Now, I am skeptical. Well, they said (laughs) win-loss record and other considerations. See, I don't know if uh, like DDT Digest Digest was around in 1996 or if they came along later, but I'm betting if we went back and checked the win-loss records of these men, they probably weren't all great. Well, I mean, you've got Hulk Hogan. Mm-hmm. You who, won all the time. Sure. You've got the Giant, who, if nothing else, he's the champion. That's sure. your other consideration. Sure. Ric Flair was the champion this year, right? Ric Flair and Randy Savage wrestled each other all the time. They can't both have great win loss records. Well, no, but but they are they are Ed, the, they're the cream of the crop. They were clearly the top guys. Sure. I'm not complaining about the names themselves. I'm just saying that. I, I suspect if I did the math, their win-loss records may not be the best. Well, that's why they said, and other considerations. So, out of these six finalists... Merch they, sales. They then <laughs> drew three names at random, and the, the random names were Randy Savage, Sting, and Lex Luger. That's right. And Gene read these names. I figured they would come out on stage and say something, but no. Gene announced the names. He threw it up to Heenan and Shivani, and Heenan and Shivani said, okay, see you next week, and it was over. <laughs> yeah. I, I thought it was a hell of a show. And man, they're so patient. Not one appearance by Hall and Nash on this show. That's right. The the day after the, the big Great American Bash where they killed Bischoff, not one appearance by these men. Their, their patience is astounding when you see how things end up going. But yeah, very, very good edition of Nitro. I hit stop on the DVR. I almost hit delete. I turned the TV off. I put on my shoes and my jacket. And I went outside for a walk. It's beautiful. Flowers are blooming. Birds were chirping. What am I doing with my life? Why am I watching this? St- I, I, why am I watching this shit? The guy got into the ring and got his ass kicked. I still can keep the day from ending. The Are these matches that hard? That no, they're not. Here's how you do a war games, everyone. 
but not fucking hard. Well, Start with two guys in the ring, they fight for a while. Then another guy hits the ring, and every time a guy hits the ring, his team wins until another guy hits the ring. And that's it. That's all you need to do since 1987 since the first one. At some level, I would like to enjoy wrestling. Maybe I'm weird that way. But when I see a finish this stupid, I feel like I'm being kicked in the balls. Sounds like Ryback. No, 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 then it got worse. So it's already an unmitigated disaster. And then Big E returned, and he destroyed Titus. And then, then, the crowd is crying out for a table spot. Big E didn't give him one, and so he got booed. Well, I said, Horrible, horrible, horrible finish. What is the point of the show? What is the point of the segment? What is the point of my life? <laughs> Bell rang and the crowd started booing, and it wasn't the kind of booing, oh no, our favorite guy lost. It was the booing, like, god damn it, you motherfuckers ripped us off. I, was, I don't want to watch Raw ever again in my life. <laughs> wow. Sensitive Vinny. That was tremendous. <laughs> I like the part about kicking the balls personally. <laughs> That's my favorite. Wow. Well, let's get going. All right, Nitro. Nitro. June 24th, 1996. Eric Bischoff was missing a second straight show selling Kevin Ash's powerbomb. Holy shit. What an amazing concept. Two weeks. <laughs> the guy, an announcer at that, gets hurt, and so he, he can't come to the show. Meanwhile, Machine Gun Kelly is tweeting the next day. About what a pussy the guy is. And then he's on Raw, the pre-show, a week later, not selling it. He was on the pre-show? Downplaying it. Oh, yeah. Like live? I don't know if it was live, but... He was making it seem like, eh, I just done got powerbombed through a table. Who cares? Good for Bischoff. <laughs> so they were in Charlotte, and the fans demanded flair all night long. They uh, showed on Nitro for the first time Bischoff actually going through the table. Hell of a powerbomb. Oh, yeah. And they still had not named the outsiders, referring to them as these two gentlemen. Well, apparently they had some... Uh, they weren't always going to call him Hall and Nash. Mm -hmm. They were they were trying to come up with some sort of name that they could trademark that I guess was maybe close to Diesel and Razor Ramon. And I guess the thing was they they were they were they either were going to get it figured out or they were going to call him Hall and Nash. Mm -hmm. And the fact that they called him Hall and Nash that answers your question. Yeah, so that's think, the reason why they didn't know what they were going to call him at this point. I'm almost positive Gene referred to them as the Outsiders or Outsiders. On this show, yeah. Well, they called I, them the out. They called them outsiders. Yeah, yes. I don't think it was their name. I think it's just a yeah. descriptive term yeah, of what yeah. they were. It it just stuck. Yeah, well, I mean, they were. Because I think if you would have called them invaders, ah, that would indicate they were coming from WWE and maybe stab you. But if you called them outsiders, that could have meant they were from anywhere. Gotcha. So. Backstage, Gene o Oakland interviewed at Team WCW, which was Sting, Lex Luger, and Randy Savage, all wearing face paint like Sting. So Savage cuts this promo, and he's going crazy, and he says, our plan is to divide and conquer. And then he left. <laughs> <laughs> that was ironic. <laughs> Which team is he dividing here? So Sting and Lex rambled on for a while. Rambled on? Mm -hmm. Lex was talking about how this was all... This was what WWWCW stood about stood for. <laughs> that is what he said. Yes, I can't remember his exact line, but I remember WWWCW was in there. It was WW pause, thinking thought balloon appears. I fucked up, and then WCW. Hey, you know what? You know what though? Maybe it was on purpose because people thought that Lex was going to be the mystery third man. Mm, I thought of that. So. Anyway, Steiners and Harlem Heat come in, and they're both demanding title shots, and everyone starts screaming at each other, and Tony Schiavone says they would have a triangle match later. Blue Bloods versus Public Enemy. Holy fuck. This made the show worthwhile. <laughs> Steven <laughs> Neagle's great, isn't he? <laughs> First off, Public Enemy had the longest entrance ever. It was like, 
the ramp was a mile long, and they just kept coming down this ramp forever. And then they do this inset promo, which I'm not sure if they had to edit something out or what, but there was silence for like three seconds, and then they started talking. I assume they were drowned out by their own dubbed-in WWE Network music. That could have been, because yeah. they do have this goofy song that they use there. Still better than Samoa Joe's. So then Regal was a wrestling god. The The very beginning of the match, he goes in there with Rocco Rock, who, regardless of what you think when you see Public Enemy, Rocco Rock did not suck. Or at least he didn't always suck. So he got in the ring, and they start wrestling. And they're exchanging holds. And Regal does a reversal. He does a judo throw. And then he stands up, and he begins to dance and swivel his hips. <laughs> And he turns around and gets Jeraki in the face, which he then proceeds to sell like he'd been lit on fire. Mm -hmm. The way I described this was he sold this drop kick by taking a dozen bumps without ever getting off his back. Yeah. <laughs> He's a fish out of water. And actually, he was great even before that because Public Enemy gets in the apron, but the music's still playing and they're still doing their wave their hands in the air thing. And Regal proceeds to not only wave his hands in the air, but also wiggle his ass back and forth. <laughs> He was so Regal awesome. Regal was the best. Dave, I believe, said this was heavy into the negative stars. He didn't actually give a negative star rating. And while this match was a disaster, <laughs> this was a hilarious, worthwhile disaster to <laughs> sure, watch. Sure, Johnny Grunge had a cast on because he legit broke his hand. He's still fucking wrestling, by the way. And so he gets he's going to use it as a weapon, but Nick Patrick stops him. And I'll talk more about Nick Patrick later, but he gets drop kicked or he gets tripped and he falls on his own cast and sells it like he's knocked out. That's right. Mm -hmm. Which I'm laughing at because I'm like, huh, great finish. But no! <laughs> he then gets up and he hits Taylor with his cast and pins him. Yeah. A fucking mess. <laughs> but this was so much fun. Favorite thing Regal did, he was quote unquote moonwalking. Everything. He was quote unquote moonwalking, but really he was just walking backwards. <laughs> Yes. And 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 doing the wave with his hands. He was so great. Kevin Sullivan versus Kip Davey. I believe Is that name. what you got out of this? That's what I got out of this man's name. Huh. I got uh, Chip Amy. <laughs> I got Kent Amy. <laughs> okay. I don't know what they said, but I did Google <laughs> this episode of Nitro, and the first report that came up listed him as Chip Amy. But I can find no references on the website anywhere, anywhere on the World Wide Web, as they call it, to a Chip Amy. What did you get, Vinny? Kip Davey. All right, let's find Kip Looking Davey. Up right now, there's a lot of Kip Davies, but none of them apparently ever wrestled. And I don't see a Kip Davey. What did you get, Craig? <laughs> Kent. Kent. And here's the way I spelled it. A-H-E-E. -E. <laughs> Kent a -E? A he, I don't think that's right either. Probably not. Holy shit! There is a Kent A he. Ha ha! You are right. <laughs> no way. Did you really look this up? No. Wow, that's his name, Kent A he. How about that? Um, if it's the same guy I'm looking up here, his real name is Kevin Greeno. <laughs> <laughs> I guess you couldn't use that now, could you? I suppose not. How about that? What do I win? Uh, nothing. A match with Kevin Greeno. It doesn't look like he had many matches. You don't say. I so, can find one. All they did was Sullivan jumped him. He dragged him up the stairs, out in the concourse, tried to go in the women's room, security stopped him, and the match was thrown out. That Kent was, Ahi. That was Kent Ahi's Nitro debut. He's named after a fish. He is a fish. I think that's Mahi. Oh, you're right. <laughs> it's delicious in tacos. Mm-hmm. Uh. So Sullivan returns to the ring. Oakland interviews him and Jimmy Hart. They said they were in Horseman Country, but they were gonna they had walked into Horseman Country and they were gonna walk out too. And the gimmick is they have a tag match at the pay per view against uh, I think it was Benoit and Arn. And if the Horseman won, then any of the Horsemen, including Flair, would get a title shot the next night on Nitro. But Sullivan and Hart said that was not, they were not gonna let that happen. And Hart noted if he heard one more Ric Flair cliche, he was gonna choke himself to death. Wow, where was? And or the gaint on this show. He was not on the show, was he? Huh. Dean Malenko versus Bobby Walker. Oh. What a testament to Bobby Walker. A boring match with Dean Malenko. I think Dean just kept him grounded. 
Oh, yeah? I can imagine him in the back, and Bobby's like, I'm going to go up top, and Dean's like, no. I saw your last match. You're not going up top for anything. So Disco Inferno comes out to distract everyone with the gold record. He hit the ring to dance, and this distracted Walker. <laughs> he's, he's in the fucking ring dancing to his music. Uh-huh. This is not a disqualification. No. I was impressed that Dean Malenko, who his entire gimmick because he never changes his expression, actually looked pissed. <laughs> <laughs> so, Malenko kicks Walker in a disco and then pins him with a Northern Lights <laughs> he suplex. He kicked him face first in a disco's ass. Uh-huh. Just like they did with Tamina and Naomi on Raw. Yeah. Which is a finish. Uh-huh. Sure. And Oakland interviewed Malenko in the ring. Disco interrupted, said... This is about TV ratings, and Malenko and Walker were sticking up the joint, so he came out to plug his record. My God. You know what's funny is that it really was about ratings, but this was the first time I ever heard someone on television talking about TV ratings. He was years before his time, ranting about TV ratings that no viewer could possibly give a shit about. Mm -hmm. I don't know if this is like the... If uh, Vince Russo was feeding them skits or angles from across the nation before he came over, but that's what it felt like. And then Disco left, and Dean didn't do anything. Well, he cut a shitty promo. He did cut a shitty promo. He said, I have a thousand holes, but I only need one to take you out. <laughs> I'm just going to read my notes in the next segment here. They had a Bash at the Beach promo where two women in bikinis told a geek he was not invited and pushed him into the water. Man. What the hell was this? It's bullying. I guess so. This is supposed to make me want to buy a wrestling pay-per-view. Well, in 1996, women in bikinis on TV could, in fact, make you want to buy a pay-per-view. And yeah, you would. Barbarian versus Eddie Guerrero. Holy smokes. Dave thought this was a terrible match as well. and Why? It fell apart a little bit at the end. But overall, this was a pretty good match. It was like one screwed up Rana. The fans absolutely loved the Barbarian. I have no idea why. He's big and scary. And he did this huge top rope belly to belly. He's just destroying this poor guy. And the thing I got out of this more than anything is that he pins him. And Larry Zbysko <laughs> proceeds to completely. I had forgotten how much people hated Larry Zbysko as a commentator mm-hmm. because I hadn't heard him for so long. And I thought he had a really good speech at the Hall of Fame. And I had him on the show and he talked about all sorts of crazy shit. But now looking back, I fully understand why people hated him as a commentator. His whole gimmick was to tell you, the viewer, how awesome he was Mm -hmm. and how not awesome everybody else was. And he buried Eddie. He said he sucked. He said he made a ton of mistakes in the match, and he just got lucky. I was like, wow, way to put this guy over, Larry. Well, the whole point of the match was Barbarian was a big, strong guy who threw this little Mexican fucker around, Mm -hmm. slammed him with ease, big, giant powerbomb. You mentioned the suplex. And the finish is Barbarian tries a superplex. Eddie falls on top, and it looked like legit they fell. <laughs> and Eddie, the ref counts three, and Barbarian kicks out at 3.1. So this is uh, this match was everything they could do to make the winner not look like a legit winner. So he could not come out of this looking particularly good. But it really didn't help when Zabisco goes, he got so lucky. Yeah, well, all Zabisco did was point out the truth here. <laughs> I, can't, I can't blame him entirely. I, not defending him. But then... Gene cuts a pro, or excuse me, Gene interviews Eddie, and uh, they're talking about whatever, and Eddie says he wants to fight for Team WCW, and then the Nitro music starts to play, and Gene asks another question, so Eddie starts to talk, and then Gene cuts him off. <laughs> like Gene, the, you idiot! It's like a Grammy speech that was heading towards a commercial. This segment did Eddie zero favors. No. And Eddie's promo is about how he wants another shot at the U.S. title. That's right, yeah. Mm-hmm. So... If that's what's going to be the promo at the end of the match, why the fuck would you bury the guy throughout the entire segment leading to this poor guy asking for a championship match? I don't know. This ain't WWE nowadays where the U.S. title's a joke. This was like an important belt back then. Conan held it. <laughs> yes. Or whoever held it. It was Conan here. Mm. Was it? Arn Anderson and Chris Benoit versus the Rock and Roll Express. Part of this match was lost due to technical difficulties. I didn't miss anything. It was? 
Yeah, there was a there was a crawler on the bottom of the screen. Oh, I didn't see it. Was, crawler. it was after the commercial break, and and honestly, I don't know how much they lost. It it seemed like nothing. It looked really seamless, whatever it was. If they hadn't put this crawler up there, I would have had no idea what they're talking about. Right, or, or no, never noticed. Anyway, Shivani's talking about all that's going on in WCW, the in, the invasions going on. Bash at the Beach is the biggest match in the history of the company, the most important night. Everyone in the company is unified, wanting Team WCW to win. He says he even talked to politicians who are very concerned about what's going to happen. Shouldn't politicians have more important things to do? They should. They do. So they were in Charlotte. The place was going nuts for Arn. They suckered Ricky Morton into a double team on the floor for the heat, and they, they, they set a trap for him, basically, and he fell into it. And Mongo's standing there watching it all unfold, and Benoit pops up and clotheslines Ricky, and Mongo just starts to cackle. And Mongo, as the as the heavy who just stands there looking big and scary with a suitcase and then laughs when their evil plans are uh, unfold. Great role. It's a much better role than a commentator. Yeah. Yeah. So things break down into a four way and Gibson tries to backslide and Mongo bunks him with a briefcase and Benoit gets the pin. And who should come out to make the save? We should not mention that every single time the horseman did anything, including the finish, the place went crazy. Yeah, yep. It was weird not hearing the Rock and Roll Express get cheered by the young ladies in the crowd. Just Absolutely overpowered by Flair fans. Did you see the Rock and Roll Express in this match? It's it was 1996. They looked older 86. than all of us put together. It's very true. The mullets didn't help. Nothing helped. Nothing helped. Tights. So the only person who came out to save the Rock and Roll Express was Joe Gomez. Well, you know, he had a big debut last week, Vinny. He was triple teamed to death. You've never heard a triple teaming cheered so vociferously. <laughs> That's a horseman beatdown. Uh -huh. It's great. And Savage and Kevin Green went out to make the save and chase the horseman out. And the fans were torn. They love the horseman, but they also love Savage and Kevin Green just signed to play for their team. So this is a very traumatic moment for the fans. You know what was funny about this? I'm not really a football guy. Really? Uh, but football is very popular these days, huh. as Vinny can attest. But here they were in Charlotte, North Carolina, and you had Kevin Green, and he's out there representing the Carolina Panthers. He's about to get back on the team. He ends up cutting the show, this promo here on the show about how he's going to go back and they're going to beat some ass, and then he's going to come back and take out his anger on Mongo. And the fans, with the option of cheering the local football star or cheering heel Ric Flair... They chose the horseman. Well, the football star had been a local star for, at this point, about three months. Flair had been a local star for 20 years. That's true, but I, I was just shocked. They also stated that Joe Gomez would be wrestling um, Mongo at the pay-per-view. At the oh, pay-per-view? Oh, my God. That's why he came out to make the save. I can't wait to see that match. I missed that line. Pay-per-view, you say? what it said. Well, you got to have an undercard. Mongo in his first solo match on pay-per-view. Yeah. Hmm. Oakland interviewed Flair and the girls backstage. What a motley crew. Flair was going crazy. And then Benoit, Arn, and Mongo arrived to join the party, and Mongo just starts screaming about how nobody could stop them, and Flair sings a song to Conan, and Oakland wrapped things up. This was insanity. Oh, yeah. This was where I uh, got googling mongo and discovered he was in fact joe park <laughs> and so literally i have no idea what happened in ddp versus alex Wright. i paid no attention whatsoever you missed nothing no okay that's good to know uh alex Wright hit two schoolboys and page kicked out of both of them holy smokes <laughs> i was amazed at this that's how that no wonder ddp ended up a world champion that's right so he was throwing these punches alex was and page was doing this horrible over-the-top cartoon selling he was a Terry Funk fan. This was not Terry Funk. Not everyone can be Terry Funk. You write that down. <laughs> so the announcers weren't even talking about it. They just talked about the pay-per-view. They had a very sloppy match, and Paige won with a diamond cutter out of nowhere. And then speaking of matches at the pay-per-view, Paige cut a promo hyping up a taped fist match with Hacksaw Duggan. Oh, God. No wonder I never watched this show. Now, wait a second. Is <laughs> Hacksaw going to tape his fist beforehand? He finally figured it out. <laughs> Maybe I should tape my fucking fist well, in the he back. He figured it out, but he was dumb enough to let the other guy do it, too. It's true. Oakland interviewed Kevin. Wouldn't it be awesome if they had a tape fist match, and as they're, they're going to the finish, 
Hacksaw untapes his fists. <laughs> or tapes it more. <laughs> He's trying desperately to untape him and he gets knocked out. Uh, so Oakland interviews Kevin Green, who essentially says that he is going to go now get ready for it's football season. He's going to go get ready for football. They're going to shock the world. And in fact, they almost did, by the way. But uh, after that, he's going to come back and he's going to get team with Randy Savage. They're going to find two partners. They're going to get some payback. All I can think was, are they planning on bringing Kevin Green back to do war games with the Four Horsemen? I think maybe that was the plan. Maybe that never happened. Plans change, but holy cow. VK Wall Street versus Randy Savage. This was when I realized that this show was raw. Because it's not like these, I mean, Randy Savage is awesome. And VK Wall Street was fine. But fuck, they just had a, they just had a match. Yeah, there's no point. And it went on and on and on. And I was zoning out. And I was like, God damn, this is exactly how I feel when I watch these generic Sheamus versus Roman Reigns matches on Raw. Yeah, that's it's just fair. a long, boring match. Nothing happened. It, it was just nothing. During the match, did Shivani work with Bobby Heenan last week? I think so. Okay, so this is their second appearance together, and their terrible chemistry was right there from the very early days. They worked awfully together. They were cutting each other off. They were no selling each other's jokes. Just a terrible announced team from day one that still stuck together for like five years. So eventually, Wall Street rolls outside to avoid the big elbow, and Cameron Green throws him into the steel post and throws him back in. And then Savage hit the elbow, and he won. He had a hell of a flying elbow. The best flying elbow in wrestling history. You see that with extra emphasis. Why are you baiting me? <laughs> Not, Craig, listen. Okay, maybe you and I would be equal on the Shawn Michaels fandom scale. Mm-hmm. There, there's there's few people bigger fans of Shawn Michaels than myself mm. and you. But I'm also a fair man. And Randy Savage had a better flying elbow than Shawn All Michaels. Right, that's nice of you to say. I'll give I'll give Shawn Michaels second place because his was way better than CM Punk's. You know who else had a great Wait. elbow? <laughs> better than Dean Ambrose's, who forgets <laughs> that the guy's supposed to be laying down. Perry Saturn had an awesome top row belt. Yeah, it was all right. That's true. Sean was Sean was a, a, a strong second place. Main event, Harlem Heat versus Steiners versus Sting and Luger in a triangle match. Another raw match. Yeah. Three random teams stuck together, man a title on the line for no reason. Let me let me let me talk about this. Please. <sighs> I know it's fake. What? I know that Nick Patrick, I know that referees are supposed to be incompetent. <laughs> but they have this fucking match, and the storyline is, with a few minutes left in the show, Scott Hall and Kevin Nash come through the crowd with baseball bats. Mm-hmm. And everybody's going nuts, and as soon as they get to ringside, they start pounding on the metal steps with the bats, and security flies down to the ring. They fly down to the ring, they slide into the ring, they've got their guns, they've got their hands on their hips, there's this big stare down. The fans are going nuts. And suddenly, Tony Schiavone screams, The titles have changed hands. Yeah. And I went, What? There's more cops in the ring than there were wrestlers in the match. Bobby Heenan goes, What? They show a replay. By my count, there were 16 men in the ring. Mm hmm. At least nine of them had firearms. Right. And Nick fucking Patrick drops down and counts a pin. What? On a schoolboy. On a (laughs) schoolboy! Maybe the timing was bad. What? (laughs) Maybe somebody was supposed to do the schoolboy before the cops actually got into the ring. But let me tell you something. When... Ten fucking policemen hit the ring with guns. The match is over. Okay, Nick Patrick? You don't let the match go. Everybody's distracted, except for Booker T. It's like literally the only guy. Not the first time he's been surrounded by ten cops, apparently, since he'd served time. But fucking ten cops hit the ring, and he's like, now's my chance. Yeah. And he rolls the dude up, and Nick Patrick's like, oh, shit. Shoulders down. Ah, new champions! This was so... 
This was dumber than Roman Reigns running to the back. Yeah. Because of a video. Holy shit. 16 men inside the ring, and he counts the pin. With guns. With guns. And God, zoomed, that was stupid. He zoomed in to show the hands on firearms. Holy smokes. <laughs> They didn't even show one of those vignettes where Nick Patrick has actually got the wrestling rule book and saying, look, there's nothing in there about cops and guns in the ring. <laughs> Jesus. <laughs> Could you have looked more incompetent? The answer is no. Like, how in storyline is Nick Patrick not, like, suspended for fucking incompetence? Cops should have shot him. So, well, Craig, it's got a family and all. In the leg. Yeah. Just, you know, flesh wound. Anyway, this was this was beyond stupid. So the match was really boring. Yeah, yeah. That point. And I got bored, and my mind started to wander. I was looking at these guys, and think of who's in there. Right. How could it have been boring? And it was. And it was. It was very boring. And uh, all I could think about, I, I, I don't know how, exactly how I got to this, but I thought, you know, Scott Steiner still does indie shows. Mm -hmm. Rick Steiner does once in a while. And then I had a brilliant idea. And I've checked in this, and Steiner, in fact, is doing stuff with Global Force. Somebody, somewhere, needs to book the Steiners against the Young Bucks while they can. Oh, man. If only, if only, I would pay hundreds. I swear to God, I would pay hundreds of dollars to hear Scott Steiner cut a promo on them. <laughs> I actually, I honest to God, if someone puts that together, I will donate $100. <laughs> yes. That would be so great. And, that, and thinking about that was more exciting than anything that happened here. And that was Nitro. These were two boring shows. And they were very, very, very boring shows. The really bad thing is I watched the ROH pay-per-view. Don't do before. stuff like I know. that. I'm so you dumb. should know better. I, sh I should have. There was one other thing I want to mention. As much as Tony Schiavone and Bobby Heenan had no chemistry, and as much as Tony Schiavone ended up getting really bad at his job, the end of the show, there's carnage. The outsiders have vanished or whatever. Guys are going to the back. Heenan's panicking. And Shivani apologizes first for not facing the camera because he's scared, he notes. But then he turns to the camera and he buckles down and he does this big promo about how if you think WCW is just going to sit back and take this, you're wrong. We're going to fight. We're going to fight for the legacy of this great sport of professional wrestling. We're not just going to lay here and take it. And I thought, it'd be a goddamn good promo if that actually happened. WCW fucking took it till they were dead. A long time. Man, in hindsight, they never got their win. They just got their asses beaten and beaten and beaten until everyone thought they sucked. And then they told you they sucked. And then they went out of business. <laughs> if only Tony Schiavone had been in charge because it was a hell of a promo he actually cut a hell of a promo all things considered but it was not to be there you go everybody those are your shows let's uh, do one last song here and then we'll wrap it up I got a lot of great songs lately this one here from Nathan the gimmick is now that Bull is fat He's fat and he's out of shape. And all he does is eat junk food. Chomping on potato chips. And when his music says, Bull! They yelled, Fat. Bull Dempsey, you're too fat. And then you do a segment with Regal where you're eating chips because you're fat. And apparently he was like, Hey, if I'm going to be fat, I'm going to be fat. And he did it great. And he had to do a little bit of running. And he got so tired. He was so tired that he immediately ate pizza. Samoa Joe, I'm not going to bury the guy, but he ain't the fattest guy here. Bull Dempsey, he played this fat, out-of-shape guy gimmick to the hilt. Bull is uh, taken off across the, the room with a full fucking slice of pizza in his mouth. Today we discovered he is a fan of sweet potato fries. Good. Yeah. Twice we caught him eating sweet potato fries. Because he's fat. He's fat because he's fat. Bull is fat. He's fat. He's challenged all of us. He's been world champions before. Been in his business 15, 20 years. And this fat son of a bitch is going to try us all out. He's fat. 
<laughs> <laughs> Great finish. Ah, oh, that was a good one.